Your resilience and how you actually get through the downtimes is what creates your character. Can you knowingly overcome adversity? That's the important thing. So this was a bar this was the barbershop. Did you ever come in here when it was a barbershop? I no, 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 no. Yeah, so this was the barbershop. So we redid this part and so this the drop ceiling was like this all the way. So we didn't know the ceilings went all the way. To right. The so cool. I know. So you're what are you doing back there? That's gonna be like office space. Oh. Like that's gonna be Sam's office. And then like all the editing stuff will go back there. So you stole extra <clears throat> height there, but not here. Why? Well, we were doing this this what this was the actual barbershop. Uh -huh. So like we were like, oh, this would be perfect. That was the waiting room of the barbershop. So like we kept this. And then you you need to sh for to, to record you 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 actually kind of want the drop ceiling because right. you don't want you yeah. don't need an extra ten feet above you for sound reasons. Sure. So this is just this. Okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know this was here. This is awesome. Yeah, there's actually they're actually they built the three buildings at the same time. Uh -huh. And so the bookstore and the record store were connected and then this was separate and then it it went for sale like during the pandemic. So we got it. But the sad the sad slash cool thing about it is this was a barbershop since it opened, like in the 1800s. Wow, it's old school. And then the guy, uh, John, who was the last person, he, he, I was talking to him, I came in here and I was like, this is like right when I bought it. And he was like, oh yeah. I was like, you can stay as long as you want. That was like the condition of buying it from the, the, the people, the family that had owned it for a long time. They were like, you have to keep John in here as long as I want, as he wants. And I was like, okay. And uh, so I was talking to John about it and he was like, you know, I did all the, renovations myself and like it looked really it was like you know janky yeah it was really starting to fall apart <laughs> and um i was like oh when did you do that and he's like oh when i moved in in 1969 Whoa. so he'd been here 50 years wow yeah yeah it was pretty cool so you you have to offer haircuts yes like he, at least by appointment only something he was the nicest guy he cut my hair a couple times he cut my kids hair a couple times and then one time i walked by and uh, I saw him at his front, his like desk or whatever, mm. and he was reading a magazine with a magnifying glass. And I was like, might be time. Mm. I feel that though. Yeah. You need glasses at all? Uh, sometimes, probably. I just got glasses recently. Yeah. So I'm this was like that. a Mr. Magoo level magnifying right. glass to read a magazine. <laughs> and then he's like, I come near your head with sharp scissors or a razor. So, uh, he he was he was the best though. He was really nice. And then like we fat when they when they're doing the renovation, they found a license plate. I don't know where it is, but they found a license plate from nineteen thirty. So cool. The other crazy thing, this is like only a bass trip thing, which is like it the original survey was like it's called the Miller survey, right? That's like the survey they did when they mm -hmm. plotted out the lawn for the first time. The 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 and we bought it from the Miller family. So it had been in the same family the wow. whole time. Mm -hmm. It's nuts. So I, I really love just um, bringing back, bring, bringing forth the old history. Yeah. Um, and there's so much of it on, on our land. We have, the, the rumor was, the legend was that there was an old whiskey sill. Probably. And there were, um, we have springs on our land. So they used to use the spring water to distill the whiskey. And so we were um, doing some renovations, uh, re restoration, I should say, on the springs. And we ended up uncovering this old whiskey sill, like this wow. copper, um, you know, basically a cauldron. And uh, so I want to restore it and start making whiskey on the land. That's amazing. It's such a cool story, right? Yeah, my neighbor has a cistern on his property. You know what that is? Like a, a giant, uh, it's like you dig a giant hit, pit and then you line it with bricks and you store water in it. Yep, yep. Because it was a way stop on the El Camino Real. Yeah. You're just like, it, it's obviously, it. the United States doesn't feel very old, but then there are parts of it that are quite old. Like um, um, Chestnut in um, Bastrop, which is like this street right over here. That is the King's Highway. Mm. Not and not like the English King, like the Spanish King. Oh, the Spanish King. Right. Yes. Oh yeah, that's right. That makes sense. That you know what the six flags are, right? Um yes, it's the the, it, the different flags it, that settled here. Yeah, yeah. that that were <clears throat> Texas wasn't like first off, Texas is the only state that was its own country, or other than Hawaii, I guess. But like it wasn't like Oh, it just went back a ways. It was like Spanish, French, mm -hmm. English, 
is it English? Spanish, French, Mexican. You're just like, there's a lot of his, and Texas. And Confederate. Is Confederate yes. is unfortunately one of the, <laughs> one of the, like, they, they might want to, you know, to, modify yeah, maybe it. just five flags. Yeah. <laughs> maybe add a rainbow flag and then call it a day. That's probably the flag they don't want to add. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I really, um, I don't want to lose the history. Sure. You know, and there's, I, I want to spend some time interviewing the people who've lived on my land. Have you found some? Yeah. So I've been in communications, especially because it's like, hey, where's the, where's the septic? And, sure. they, and they're like, oh, I, I don't remember, you know. So even just to uncover some of the uh, infrastructure, it's important yeah. to like stay in touch. But then also, what was the land like? Because it's changing so much. There's so many track housing mm -hmm. and, and development and suburbia coming in that all of that history is going to get lost. I know of springs that they bulldozed and just buried to build houses. Yeah. And so in, in an effort to preserve the land, the, the natural topography, and then to know what the land was and what it meant to people, I want to start actually documenting that. Have you seen the, like right up the road uh, on 969, there's like where they crossed the river before there were bridges, the ferry. There, like there's the, no, I forget what that? it's called. It's There's like a, it's, it's a, a butts next to a mobile home park, but there was until they could use iron to build bridges they couldn't bridge the colorado river and so up until the 30s the old bridge that they have like right down i guess right there is they they imported that from somewhere like they bought it from another city that didn't want it and they moved it here but that was the first bridge across the river and so up until the 30s they would cross the river the colorado river here like on a ferry or like or a ford you know mm -hmm. like where the river will get low enough and that's like just still there but it's just kind of next to a oh, cool yeah, home I, I like i want to check that out no i haven't seen that and it's Is, it's crazy to think it's like there's the ford and then or the ferry spot and then like right down the road is like a spacex facility so the oh, know, yeah the, the contrast of like a hundred years like hey we can't get across the river you have to put your Ford Model T on this boat and drive it across to like, oh, here's the facility where we are going to build pieces for something that eventually goes to Mars. Yeah. The contrast of that is insane. Yeah. It's, it's pioneer land. Yeah. One way or the other. Yeah. On always. the forefront. Yeah. yeah. And then also to think not that long ago. So like the Bastrop is like the piney forest, right? Or the Lost Pines. Mm -hmm. And so they would cut down the trees, but then like, how do you transport the lumber? So then they would cut it down, roll it into the river and then Let float it, it to the yeah. ocean. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you, when you think about how far the ocean is from here, it kind of blows your mind. Yeah. It's a long way. Yeah. They Especially with all the twists and turns. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. So, so, if, so we do floats from my house yeah. on the Colorado to town. Yeah. And you just get out at Fisherman's it's, Wharf. Or it's whatever. like a, eight minute drive yeah, and like an hour float. Yeah, and what is it? Not very far. No, it's not far at all. Yeah. But it's a lot of twists. And yes. Yeah, just imagine trying to navigate hundreds of 50 foot trees down that river. Yeah, with all the shallow spots, the rapids, yeah. mini rapids. Well, and then what would happen is they're, they're, this is, they, they would do this on the Red River in the Mississippi too. It would get clogged with trees. Like they would just, and... and like bottleneck or something. Yeah, yeah, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and then they would just blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> that's how they would. That's how they would replace the logjam. Is they would just blow it up, or that displace the logjam. They would just blow it up. Okay. Yeah. Marcus Aurelius doesn't come out of the womb as a leader. He's not just randomly chosen by Hadrian to be his successor and then this is what makes him a great leader. Hadrian has a plan where he adopts Antoninus Pius on the condition that Antoninus adopt Marcus Aurelius. And then Marcus submits to a 20 year apprenticeship under Antoninus where he learns what it means, what it is to be a leader. And this is why Marcus succeeds. This is why absolute power does not corrupt absolutely. This is what that steals and informs Marcus's ability to respond to a pandemic, to war, to betrayal, to all the stresses and burden of the incredible leadership that falls on his shoulders. So this process, this apprenticeship 
that makes one a great leader. It's something we all need to undertake in our own lives, whether we're running a small company, leading an enormous team inside of a company, whether we're the head of a platoon of Marines, or we're just trying to be a better parent, which is a form of leadership. Becoming a great leader takes time, and that's why the longest and most in-depth challenge that we've done here at Daily Stoic, the Daily Stoic Leadership Challenge, is almost three months long. It's a deep dive, an email a day, a series of live Q&As with me and other leaders. We're gonna be talking about how you master your emotions, how you deal with difficult people, how you prepare for and get through adversity, and then the stoic philosophy behind leadership and responding to challenge. We're really excited for you to join this leadership masterclass. I think it's one of the best things we've done here at Daily Stoic. I got so much out of making it. I get so much out of the interactions we're gonna have together. Registration is now open and the course begins on September 25th. Just go to dailystoic.com slash lead to join. And remember Daily Stoic Life members get this challenge and all the Daily Stoic challenges, including New Year New You, which is coming up at the end of the year. All of these totally for free. When did you move here? Uh, man, it's been about so uh, almost two and a half years. To to this to shop. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Austin, I was I've been here for almost six years. Okay. Yeah, five and a half years, and I've been coming to Austin for over a decade. Yeah. And I had a little uh, bungalow on the east side, so I'd come here quite often. I, I'd come here at least once or twice a year for South by. Yeah. Because I had um an artist run music label. So we used to do showcases at Arlen studio mm -hmm. every year. And then I just met a bunch of cool people, made some friends and uh, started a beer company with uh, many investors from Austin and uh, just fell in love with the town. I think we have the same almost exact trajectory because I basically moved to Austin from New York yeah. and then I, to, east, to the east side which I loved. And then we were like, well, if we're going to live in Texas, we should live in Texas. And that's how we ended We've up We've come here. a long way, baby. I know. I mean, from Dove Charney <laughs> here, you know? <laughs> I was going to ask, I want to ask you about that. I know. So, well, we started this interview, right? Yeah, yeah. Why not? <laughs> so, I guess in no particular order. Yes. We we are on uh, very, like parallel paths. And how long have you been here? I moved here in 2013, so 10 years. Not, I mean, to, to Texas, Texas in 2013. Oh, yeah. And then we got our place out here in 2015. Okay, yeah, you were a few years before. Yeah, the first weekend we moved here, um, the day, so, so it's like we moved here on, I think it was Memorial Day, and it starts like raining. It's like, okay, I don't think like Memorial Day, lots of rain, starts raining, 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 raining. And then, uh, then there's like a tornado watch. And our house has like a, a safe room in it. So we're, we're like, oh, do we have cool. to go in, in the safe? So that, <laughs> like, I've not lived in the South that long. So now I'm like hunkered down from a tornado and we're, you know, like the, the, the alerts or whatever on your phone. And, it, and then it's like, dam has burst, move to higher ground. Dam has burst, move to higher ground. Whoa. And there's a, there was an earthen dam in um, uh, the Lost Pines Park up here. Um, what's it called? Um, Bastrop State Park. There, oh, um, is it still there? Well, it, 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 burst. it burst and all the water flowed from the park down into Tahitian Village and into Bastrop and stuff. It was this crazy flood. Um, they just rebuilt the dam. Uh, but all that happened the first and then that summer, then then the park caught on fire. So it was it was a uh, it was quite a were you seriously a questioning your, your totally. life choices? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and then it, anyone that moves, like I think you think it's going to be fun to like move out to the country and you get and, and it is fun. Like the first like couple yeah. weeks you do it, so and then bees every, and butterflies. everything goes wrong, and you have no none of the skills required to fix it, mm -hmm. and so you're just completely overwhelmed, and you're like, I think I've made a huge mistake. And and then you all, you 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 realize the people sold you what you bought because they were tired of it, and, right? Yeah. And because they deferred all the maintenance on it, right. and so all of that bill comes due for you like the first month yeah. you live there. Yeah, everything starts falling apart day yeah. one. Yeah, I've exactly. been there. But so okay, so um, just in terms of the timeline, you moved here. And then you, is that what got you interested in stoicism? No, 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 no. Because <laughs> that was around the same time, right? No, no, wait. So so I got introduced to stoicism in college. And then- But when you started writing about stoicism. So my first, yeah, my first Because I would book, imagine you would have to reach into the you know, book of, sto like 
the Stoics books and Marcus Aurelius in order to help you get through yes. life in the country. Yes. Although, so, okay, so my first book on Stoicism came out right the year after we moved to Austin. So I was living in East Austin when that came out. Okay. And then I wrote A Chunk of Ego's the Enemy and The Daily Stoic on the ranch. That was like, those were the first projects Perfect. That, I, that I did there. That, that's yes. what I was getting at. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, and uh, we're all good. Um, so, so it was in college and then I was studying it and researching it and that was my life. But then I had, that, that was what I was intellectually interested in. But then my life was very, very different because I worked for Doug Charney. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right, so you took a little side. I took a break, yeah, or, okay. or there. I think, and you can probably relate to this. There was a a very big divergence between what who I thought I was and what I was interested in and who I was aspiring to be, and then what I did for a living and, would, and what yeah. my work was like what every day. What people would pay you to do? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that was yeah. That was a that was, a, and in my head, like in retrospect, that was a both a. That was like a short period and then actually a very long period. And it you're you you rationalize and justify things because it seems crazy to walk away, things seems crazy to quit. Um, it's just supposed to be one more thing or whatever. And then it, <laughs> it's a lot more job. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot getting out is a lot long takes a lot longer than you think it's gonna take. Yes, yes. I, I, we are so alike. Yeah. So you dropped out of school. I dropped out of school. We all we were hipster and, and intellectuals, and then we ended up becoming, you know, media sellouts. I guess. Yes. <laughs> and, and, then, and then we ended up here. And then we ended up here. No, I, I had the same trajectory because I resisted entourage and Hollywood and fame. And I had a lot of chances to become famous, and I said no all the time. But I used to not. Like I used to blow off auditions that I knew I was going to get because I yeah. didn't want to do it. And then I got so broke that it was like, all right, I, I compromised my values a little bit and yeah. then found success. And you have to rationalize it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to be miserable. And then the more you rationalize it, the more it becomes your identity, the more you start to appreciate it, yeah. just the lifestyle and the, you know, the, the materialism. And then suddenly you become it. I think I wanted it more. Like, I think I was like, I'm a, I'm a little bit younger than you. So I watched those shows, right? So like, I remember I worked for this writer, Tucker Max, and, when I was in college. Yeah. And uh, I went to live with him the summer after my sophomore year of college. He was like, I just sold this screenplay. I'm, and you I'm, wanted to be a writer. Yeah, I wanted to be mm -hmm. a writer. And and uh, so I, I, I like... That was, he just sold this screenplay. They were turning it into a movie. He had all these projects going on. And so I remember um, he was like, just come live with me for the summer in LA. And I think Entourage had just come out. Maybe it was the first or the second season. And um, so I'm like, this is going to be like Entourage. Like, that's what it's going to be like. And then he <laughs> oh, lived no. He lived at- I, uh, I ruined Ryan Holiday. <laughs> he, lived at, he lived at Crenshaw and Pico. So uh -huh. is as far like like in essentially the ghetto, and I slept on a mattress on the floor of the living room with like his dogs. Like it was it was as unglamorous as I remember. One day, a dog just walked into the front yard of front yard is glamorous because it was it was concrete. Like it it was like a you know a chain linked concrete paddock, and this dog. <laughs> that was clearly from a dog fighting ring, just walked into the front yard and died. And you're oh, like, like, I was like, this is terrible. not, this is not the Los Angeles lifestyle that I thought I was moving toward or moving to. So I think there was a part of me, like I was a, I was an assistant at a talent agency or a talent management agency. Yeah. And then I was working for, so I thought it was going to be this whole crazy cool thing. And it was, the opposite of that in every way. Right. Well, you're young. You, you know, yeah. I, I I was sleeping on couches myself. Yeah. You know, hanging out in offices just to use the Wi-Fi. Uh -huh. You know, in fact, I was in Mexico before Entourage. I had a thousand dollars to my name. I was making a documentary about. I was like trying to sneak into Cuba to make a documentary about Cuban hip hop, and I was just like at my lowest in life. I needed to like go home and get a real job this yeah. time, and I got a call. To, about the show Entourage and ended up like having my agent send me a ticket, like f fly me to LA reluctantly to yeah. sleep on my manager's couch 
And I just grinned. I like closed my eyes, like held my breath yeah. and just swallowed it, even though it wasn't who I was ultimately. Who did you think you were? I, I was a filmmaker. I was a musician. I, I, I acted because when I was younger, we used to make movies and on, on the high eight cameras, like me and my friends on a sure. Friday night. And you'd do what you needed to do. Like you'd hold the, the boom or you'd act or you'd hold sure. the camera because there's only a few people. So you all play many different roles. So I, I was acting really out of necessity, mm. but it wasn't, I didn't want to be famous. I didn't want to be, right. I didn't want that to be my, I, you know, I was always uncomfortable um, being the center of anything, to be right. honest. I like to be sort yeah, of yeah. in the background. Do you think that's kind of maybe why they wanted you, is that you weren't that 100%, thirsty for it? A hundred percent, because I said no to the audition yeah. multiple times, and they and they were like, who's this kid who we can't get? Because if there's a celebrity out there, they're already famous, and they're not going to do this show, sure. this pilot for yeah. a, a show, uh, without getting paid more than the budget. And all, everybody who wanted it was too thirsty. They, were, they yeah. were just desperate for it. So they didn't feel, um, you know, celebrities don't beg right. for a part. So I was the opposite of begging. I was very uh, indifferent, nonchalant, cool, suave, whatever. And I think that that, that worked. Interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, it is weird. You think that when you don't want it as bad, you seem to get the things that when you were trying, like the Buddhists call it willful will, like the harder you're trying, the sort of the worse you are at stuff. And they're, that role specifically sort of, it's it's weird to be playing a thing that you're not. It's like when, what's weird about that role is kind of like when you listen to like rappers' first albums and they're talking about like flying the on private bling, jets right, and yeah. <laughs> that they couldn't have possibly afforded yet. So you have to have some sense that, but but so what that really is is like the sort of confidence and the the identity of the thing before you've actually the faking it till you make it totally. of it totally and you not being interested because you were interested in something else sort of mimics the attitude that that person would have and look I think you got to fake it till you make it on some level sure you know, that's what acting is you know sure. I, I always think in terms of personal development you're not you're not the thing you want to be yeah but you have to try it on yeah they call it know? acting as if. As if, right? Yeah. Even do an extreme version that may be kind of phony and fake and yeah. feel awkward until it becomes more familiar, then adjust it into something more natural. And the next thing you know, it's like what I did with chess. Chess, when I was younger, I, I wanted to be, I wanted to be the type of guy that drank whiskey, yeah. listened to jazz and played chess. Right, and because I, you saw those somewhere and you they, they meant something to you. Beat or something, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And then I didn't know how to play chess. I didn't like the taste of whiskey and I was, you know, I didn't listen to jazz yeah. yet. So it was like all weird and, you know, <laughs> I, uh, you know, abstract for me. So then what did I do? Just went to jazz clubs, ordered whiskey and started playing chess. Next thing you know, I got pretty good at chess. I started to really enjoy jazz and man, that whiskey went down smooth. And I became that guy just by, huh. you know, faking it for long enough. But did you, but that's the other thing is like, was that actually who you were? Like in, yeah. do you, like no. I think I think for me too, there was there was this sense as I grew up in Northern California, so Southern California sort of had this allure, and then hot, like I I found that a good chunk of my twenties was sort of being drawn towards things, not because like I was interested in them, but because people were interested yep. in them. There's and this, you like those people, or you wanted to be a part of that. Yeah, there's this philosopher, Rene Girard. He has this thing called mimetic desire. Do you mm -hmm. know what this concept is? Yeah, yeah. It's the idea that like you don't know what you want, so you want what other people want. Yeah. And so like it was, it wasn't like I didn't even a lot of the things I ended up doing, I didn't even know existed. Right. I ended up doing them because someone was like, "That's a thing that exists that you could be good at, and I want you to do that right. thing." And I was like, "Okay." Or they embody cool. Yes. Uh, you know enough that you're like, oh, "I want to." dress like that guy or be a rock star and live the lifestyle and yes. be on entourage. <laughs> yeah, you just want you just want something better than the life you come from or more interesting than the life you come from or you want you want what's associated with it which for me I think was like th there was sort of like a dad energy in it of like approval slash like mm -hmm. they support you, they see your potential things that I I didn't really get growing up so I was like I was like Oh, well, if these father like figures, mm. 
are telling me I should do it, I should do it. Like, yeah, but, but also just the human drive to explore and, yeah. and you know try the mm -hmm. frontier of your your own life. You know, looking at you know what you could be and try it all. Try it all a little bit. Well, I noticed like like I had a series of sort of very powerful but like controversial bosses. And my sister has the same. What's your father? Your father was in the picture. Yeah, yeah, he was, but uh, he wasn't like like some sort of abusive or distant figure. But he w it, it he sort of loomed large in our house. Okay. Do you know what I mean? And was kind of, um, I don't even know how to describe. Him. I'm still actually sort of working on figuring it out myself. But it, my sister and I both have have had very similar bosses and very similar sort of like. Uh, next to the throne jobs. And you think it's reflective of your father? It doesn't strike me as a coincidence. Right. Do you know what I mean? Because right. uh, you could work and do anything. Right. And very few people tend to get those kinds of jobs slash roles. So the fact that we both ended up doing it, I've always found to be somewhat illustrated. You mm -hmm. know, it's like every, you're, all, you're always looking, you're looking for something that you didn't get or there's sort of a daddy, daddy, mm -hmm. tell me mm -hmm. you're proud of me kind of a vibe. Sure, which, yeah. Which can be very motivating, but also very, can take you far from where you should go or where you deep down want to go. Right, yeah, I mean, I've been exploring a lot about father wounds and yes. how they manifest and how we recreate them to try and overcome or earn approval or or daddy don't leave in my case, you yeah. know, all that stuff comes out. I talked about this in, in my stillness book, but like, at the height of his golf career, Tiger Woods is the greatest golfer in the world, maybe the greatest, most dominant athlete in any sport. And he seriously considers leaving to join the Navy SEALs. Like he tries to make it as a Navy SEAL, which seems insane on its face until you realize- his When did he do this? This is like 10, 15 years ago. Did he? Yeah. I did that, not know that's that. how he fucks up his knees and his back is like all these that. jumping out of airplanes. He's sort of, that's why he's so much stronger than he actually needs to be. And huh. he fucks up his knee in one case in these sort of training exercises where he gets his knee kicked out. Like they're clear, you know, like you're clearing a room, like he's doing mm -hmm. these military exercises and they, somebody accidentally kicks out his knee. It all seems insane. You're like, why would you go from golf, which doesn't seem to right. be this super aggressive physical sport to Navy SEALs. Well, his father was a Green Beret in Vietnam uh -huh. and a complete asshole and um, a sort of dominating uh, abusive figure in Tiger Woods' uh, life. Yeah. And you're like, oh, you want it. Even though his dad wasn't even around anymore, there was some part of like, I'm, it doesn't matter how much I have, how much I've done, I'm not anything until I've done what my dad's done. Yeah. It's very, very Freudian. Oh, well, you know, I, I I was thinking about this interview with you and I, 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 and it sort of clicked. I was like, great, because I have a series called Man Upright. Yeah. And it's all about, because now I'm a father, mm -hmm. right? You're a father, so like- How old now? He's two months. Wow, yeah. okay, um, you're in the shit. <laughs> um, but not wanting to repeat the patterns, mm -hmm. wanting to show up as a better man and a sure. better father for my son. And man, just knowing that no matter what you do on some level, you're going to, you're going to instill some things that, you know, you're, you're not immune. You, you can't reach perfection. No. Right. So you kind of stumble through it in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, everyone has, it, there's no people that do not have some issues with their childhood. I, I think so. I, sort of letting, not letting yourself off the hook, but being kind to yourself going like, this isn't like a thing you can win. Yeah, and it's 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 not zero sum. Yeah, there's no right and wrong, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're in a continuum of learning yourself. Yes, and part of learning yourself is, is through imitation. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're younger, you 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 look up and you, I mean, I'm doing the imitation with my son right now, like you know, like faces mm -hmm. and tongue and all the whole thing. Um, That's where they think empathy comes from. The ability yeah. to go like, oh, they're making this face at me. They're having they're mirroring my emotions back to me so that's what my emotions are and so like I, i've i think if you have parents that are bad at that mm -hmm. that's why you, you can become bad at that yeah wow huh so tiger woods yes i think while maybe his dad was a, an asshole i don't know yeah. um way worse still instilled in him some drive yeah to achieve 
you know, I don't know, phys- bodily physique, you know, heights or. Well, there's a story you might like. So he's like, you know, the famous story is like Tiger Woods is golfing at like two years old. Right. Right. And there's a story that Tiger Woods, uh, there's right. some things that you don't quite understand until you have kids. So like there's a story that what his dad would do is strap him into the like high chair and then just hit golf balls in the garage for like hours and hours and hours. And then one day Tiger Woods gets out of the out of the thing, picks up a golf club and hits it, right? Yeah. And like, I remember I first heard that and I was like, oh, that's what it takes like to be great. And then right. I go like, who just forces their kid to watch him hit golf balls for hours? Like that must suck for the kid, right? right? You sort of go like, oh, that's weird. But there's a story where like, because he started golfing so young, he became this sort of like prodigy slash media sensation. So like maybe at three or four, he was on like the Merv Griffin show. So one of those like old daytime like talk shows. Mm -hmm. And so he's like showing how he can golf and everyone's like clapping and cheering. And some actor was the other guest. It was like Gregory Peck or, you know, someone like that. I'm forgetting who it was, but they're watching this and everyone's like clapping and cheering and like, this is amazing. And uh, supposedly like Gregory Peck leans over to the host and goes like, this isn't cool at all. And he goes like, what are you talking about? And he's like, I've seen too many child actors and performers like over the years. And he's like, I know what it took to make this kid Mm. do it. And he's like, this won't end well. (laughs) And so so for like 40 years, it doesn't, it seems, or let's say 35 years, it seems that that that's totally forgotten because mm. Tiger Woods seems like the most successful, most well adjusted, like greatest athlete yeah, ever. He was performing. Yes. He was just doing yeah. what he had been molded to do. Mm. And uh there's actually a great book I have in the bookstore. I'll give it to you. Have you read Range by David Epstein? Mm-mm. It's actually this really great sort of parenting book in disguise. The whole book is basically a contrast between Tiger Woods and Roger Federer. Mm. Um so Tiger Woods is supposed to be like that's what it takes to be great. Right. And Roger Federer like doesn't pick up a tennis racket seriously until he's like 19 or something. Right. Like he he doesn't do that, but he plays lots. Of, he has this more like easygoing childhood with a lot of different experimentation. Mm. He plays all the sports, you know, mm. his identity isn't tied up in whether he wins or loses. And, you know, arguably they're the two equally dominant athletes, but one doesn't hate himself and blow up his life. Right. And the other does. Yeah, I, I really am feeling into the fact that I can't teach my kid anything. I can't, you know, show sure. them and make them do anything. I can mostly live by example mm-hmm. and be the best man I can be. And they, they will see that and emulate it and then hopefully become their own person. And really something I'm learning and I think and it's 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 related is um true sovereignty. Like being in charge of your choices yes right and not just pretending so that you're you you look cool or pleasing your friends or making mommy and daddy proud or doing the work that your boss is going to give you a raise for all these things and it's it wasn't until recently that i have found that i'm truly making my own choices yeah i mean that's what makes you good not being that way is a very adaptive skill for success in the world, right? Like doing stuff to- External world. Yeah, doing stuff so people will be pleased with you, proud of you, like you. The illusion of success or the bling. Like like compare two actors, right? One who really wants the director, dad, to be proud of them, like them, approve of them, you know, pleased with them. That's the actor who will do anything and everything mm. and will not quit. And then the one who's like self-motivated, self-contained, has their own sense of what, like ultimately one is I think more sustainable and well-adjusted and healthy, but the other is more conducive to like being controlled, being directed, you know, and also being motivated. And yeah. so like yeah. you, you, the, these these parts of ourselves are rewarded, you know, um, and then it becomes this feedback loop. And so it's really hard to break out of it. In some ways, you almost you either need either it needs to really not work for you or you need to achieve a certain amount of success. And then you have the power to go. I just don't want to be that way anymore. And you can't make me. Yeah, well, it's it's tough because there's a certain discipline inherent within 
other people telling you what to do or trying to please them. It's motivating. You yeah. know, there's motivation in it. Mm -hmm. Like, I just want to be loved or I, you know, don't leave me. So I'm going to like do a song and dance so that you like me and stay yeah. versus having to find the motivation, the driving force without all of that neurotic layer. Yeah. And that's something, I mean, frankly, that I'm, <laughs> I'm working on is like, how do I continue to achieve, make, well, it's really more financial. Like, how do I continue to to bring in money even though I'm not playing those games? Yes. And I'm truly making a decision to live a life that is what I really true who who I am. You ask, like, is that really who you were? Yeah. Like, who I really am is me now. Well, I growing up, my parents were very interested in like what people did, how much money they made, mm -hmm. their proximity or adjacentness to like fame or attention or whatever, right? Like, oh, this, like, they'd be like, we went on vacation in Hawaii and you know who we saw at the beach? Like insert famous <laughs> person, right? Or like this yeah. person lives in this neighborhood and you know who else lives in that neighborhood, right? So like even now my parents will, my parents will be like, you know, we just found out like so-and-so moved to our town. Like, so there's a lot of that, right? And so I don't think in retrospect, it's coincidence that like, there was some part of me that moved to Los Angeles that wanted to mm -hmm. be on the bestseller list, that wanted to make money, you know, that wanted to have certain people blur my books or to even just be an author, right? So, so there was this part of me that was motivated by those things mm -hmm. that are really not healthy motivations and really not meaningful motivations, but they're they're obviously good. They're they're powerful motivations, right? Yep. And so it's been a process of shedding that over time. Like I still like what I do and I still want to do it and I still want to do it at a high level, but I want to not be doing it. I've, I've tried to become more and more as a social state indifferent to those sort of things that are not really up to me and be more, do I think it's good? Did it accomplish what I was trying to do? Did mm -hmm. I work hard on it? And the weird paradoxical thing is that I've actually done better the less I have been interested in those things. Mm -hmm. Now it could be a coincidence or it could just be, I was so motivated well, by those other things that it's just Well, what's your metric for better? I mean. I just mean by, even by those old metrics. Like, okay. so my last book, Discipline's Destiny is my, is the book that I have checked on the sales the least, where I actively made decisions that made hitting bestseller lists less likely. Like I sold copies through my store, which, don't count for the list. Um, and my publisher was like, you know, if you do this, like it will affect where you end up, you know? And so a bunch right. of stuff like that, right? Um, and then the way I wrote the book- So are you, are you not getting the accolades from the outside world or you still are? Well, what I'm saying is, that, so the, as I've gone on, I've, I've optimized slash aimed at those things less but actually sold more, gotten a good chunk of those things anyway. But are, are they being counted by the outside metrics of- To know. a certain degree. It's it's this weird thing where like, it's kind of like the harder you're aiming, it's like, actually golf is a good metaphor. The harder you're trying to hit the ball in golf- The more you're gonna flank it. The more you're mm -hmm. gonna flank it <laughs> or just miss it altogether, yeah, right? Yeah. And so you kind, it's this kind of weird thing where it's you a, have to try less hard to do better. Right. And I've, I've found that in my writing career. Right, it's a meditation. So I'm selling better the less I'm thinking about trying to make something that sells. Right. Or trying to spend all my energy on the sales side of things rather than the making stuff of things. Yeah. I don't know if people can hear that, but there's literally a parade <laughs> going by the door. <laughs> the, one of the wonderful slash uh, strange things about being in a small you, you town. You need to get a trailer and take this on the road. Do a, a moving oh, podcast. Oh, we should be doing the podcast as part uh, of the parade. Exactly. <laughs> we, could, we, could, we can announce it. it it's a... Uh, that's one of the things I really like about living here, though, is just like, it's just a totally different, You there just aren't parades in, I mean, there's the Macy's Day Parade, let's right. say, but like, there's not just like, hey, all the neighbors are getting together for a Pioneer Festival next week. And, and by like, the oh, way, anybody, is, it, 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 Macy's Day Parade, you can't just go walk it. Yeah, right? yeah you can't participate in it. Sure. This, yeah. get your truck, sure. throw in a trailer, put some balloons up. And you're in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's no, it's amazing. Yeah. It's it's like living in a hundred years ago or something. Well, and my appreciation for um farm equipment now has is is at an all time high. I got a tractor, by the way. 
Nice. We may have the same one. Braden picked it out for me. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I, I bought mine from uh, the Cowboys who sold me the ranch. Oh, I thought he helped you pick one out. No, no, it was one of his. I think I think he might have ripped me off, but... Braden did? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, I thought... Remember you... Had, no, you... He, he was helping me decide whether or not I should buy it. Oh, okay. Got it, got yeah. it, got it. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe. Anyways, it's fun. It's actually... Um, I, it's, it's not... It's in the shop right now, and the, in the shop means... I'm trying to fix it, oh. <laughs> which takes a lot longer, I'll tell you. But I'm, I'm trying course. to, because trying he's to old. trying to learn how to do it. What would what, you get, a John Deere? No, it's, uh, I don't even know. Oh, it's okay. orange. That's what I Kubota. know about it. Probably, yeah. Okay. Um, so my appreciation for farm equipment has piked. Um, and I, I don't remember what it was. Did they have a, a parade here where it's literally yeah, just. Yeah, they tow the stuff, yeah. It's. Like high, like big farm equipment and hyd hydraulic machines and drill drills and they just roll through the town and you're just like wow look at this so cool well yeah and then you or you'll you'll meet someone and they drive like the dustiest crappiest oldest truck mm -hmm. and then and then they have like a two hundred thousand dollar tractor and you're like oh okay yeah different priorities yeah 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 the, 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 very expensive these these uh, the, this equipment. that's why I put it I like I just. I mean, I've lived out here eight years and we, and for hay, I used like, my ATV has this like uh, trailer that hooks up to it and you back the trailer up and then it flip, it, it, it's like a, it's a non-mechanized way of picking up the hay bales. It's really cool. Um, the physics on this thing are like insane. Okay, so it just so basically you, you, you hook it up to your ATV. It's a dump truck of sorts? No, no, so it's, it's like this. It just looks like a trailer that you would like put a boat on or mm -hmm. something, just like a standard. It, it doesn't look fancy. You hook it up to your ATV, you back it up to the hay bale. Like, let's say this is sideways, mm -hmm. right? Like the round bale. You back it up and then the, you, you slam on the, like you, you lock the brakes and then it, it folds. The trailer folds over the bale. And then these two spikes through inertia through its own yeah because because you're backing up but the wheels can't move so it full it, it's got this hinge in it I'll show you a video I see um, it's crazy this well will, this will make great radio so are you are you doing this uh, are you I doing do this hate. yourself yeah yeah and then and then so because uh, I want to come out for a proper tour of the farm and see what you're up to out there by the way we've been neighbors for how many years and we've yet. I know. Well, I've been I've been to your you've place. You've been to my place, yeah. Your place is but closer. I, um, you've been keeping me away from. I don't know what you're doing out there. Yeah, yeah. You're up I, to yeah it turns out I actually like live in a <laughs> in a. So there's this kind. So this one is cool. You just back that up, and then it, it stabs the bale, and then you crank it by hand, and it it goes yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of tension, and it's kind of sketchy. Uh, this is okay. This is this might be not work. I'll show you later. We have a, I just have a basically a spike that goes on the back of the, yeah. of the tractor. You just poke it and lift it and move it. That's what I'm doing. One by That's one. what I did yesterday. But mm -hmm. for like eight years, I did this old way um, because I didn't trust myself to not so, break, to not not take care of a tractor. So are you actually mowing your fields no, no, for hay or you you get it delivered I and see. then put the hay? And, and that's for the cows. For the cows, yeah. Okay, yeah. How many cows do you have now? Like fifteen, yeah, and, maybe. and and just cows. I have we've cows, donkeys. We had goats till we had a wild dog incident, and then we've got a chickens. dog. Yeah, that's that's the main predator out here. The dog killed wild the dogs. goats. Like a pack of wild dogs killed three goats. Fuck! Like brutally. Oh man, it was horrible. And we actually had them when we lived in East Austin, so they were like oh, more than pets. Family. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it was, I'm sorry, it was man. A, it was a. That is the, <sighs> is, we're jumping ahead, but I have found that living out here has been, like the Stoics talk about memento mori, like this practice of meditating on immortality. The, the proximity to death, even when you are trying very hard and doing your best. Brother, is you're talking my language. I mean, yes. Very eye-opening and life-changing. Mm -hmm. All day, every day. Yeah. Have you it's, lost anything yet? Of course. We just, our llama um, just had a stillbirth. Oof. It was yeah. brutal. Like, mm -hmm. we, you know, we're all of a sudden, you know, Jordan's has, you know, elbows inside trying to coax this, this poor baby out. And it just, it was, it was right. not alive. And, oh, it's, it's heartbreaking. And we, you know, a year of uh, llama's gestation is a year. Yeah. 
and we just had our child. So it was just like, right. it's like, oh. you, this isn't this abstract like thing that animals do. Like you're like, oh, that that's a mammal thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. we're not that different. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm working on a project. Um, it's a television series that I, I created about grief. Oh. And for too long, we've been in the cities yeah. and cities are designed to mask you from those realities. Of course. Right? They're an escape from our mortality, right? Mm -hmm. And here on the, on the ranch and the farm within nature, you are definitely pitting up against that razor's edge. Everything is, you know, trying to survive, trying to live something, you know, something dies and something else eats it. It's for food, right? It's you know, just, the, the longhorn skulls that are on the wall in the, in mm -hmm. the bookstore, like, so we bought the place and then the neighboring guy had the cows and then he got old and he wanted to leave. So he was like, do you want to buy my cow? So we got these cows, which he assured us were like, he's like, oh, they're like seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. And it's like immediately after we got them, they all started dying of old age. Like they were like 20 years old. <laughs> like, uh, like I have, I, that is one of, the, Slaker. one of the humbling things we've learned out here is just like the, your neighbors are really nice, but they will also trick the shit out of you uh if uh they want to get rid of something a deal's a deal exactly so we bought yeah. these we bought these old cows and then so like one of them like one of them got so old that like it couldn't eat anymore like so it's like slowly dying so we you know the vet comes out and he's like i think you got a little more time blah blah so we're like okay um and then like you know flash forward a couple months later it's like definitely near death it's not eating and you call the vet and the vet's like okay i could come out like next week and uh you know it'd be like 200 $50, I'll like yeah. put it down. He's like, but you should just take care of it. And I go like, well, what does that mean? This is like, we just, he's like, you have a gun, right? You should take care of it. And I was like, okay. And so now, now I have to go put down oh, like my own yeah. cow. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I ultimately end up doing it, but like there's a bullet hole in the skull of that cow because like I had to put it there. And it's just, a, it's a different relationship with life. Because you didn't want to spend the money? No, no, it's not, it's not that I didn't <laughs> want to. because you wanted to yourself. <laughs> no, no, it was like, do you, am I going to let this, it's not the $250, it's do I want to let this thing suffer for an additional week no, while oh, we wait oh, for the vet, yeah, yeah. right? The vet's like, I'm busy, I'll come out, but the animal's going to suffer in the meantime. Well, more, more to the yeah. point, not only is being in charge of your choice making about your own life and how you be yeah. and you know who you are it's also about what you take responsibility for yes. like you you took charge of that situation to be a protector to be mm -hmm. compassionate to this animal and before my the animal rights you know yeah. peace and love you sure. know we are all one mentality from my liberal upbringing in new york was yes. like don't kill animals like oh those poor things you know but sure you know, have a different relationship to, to life and death now and to killing. Yeah, it's, uh, in, if you read The Little Prince, did you hear that book when you were a kid? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he goes, uh, we're responsible forever for what we've taken. I should probably reread it now it, that I'm an It's adult. a great kid's book, yeah. He, yeah. But he's, he says, we're responsible for what we've tamed. And it's like, I didn't domesticate this cow. I didn't put it here, uh -huh. but it's my problem wow. now. Mm -hmm. And it can't handle, like, so it's this, what's, what is less cruel? putting it down or letting it die naturally, painfully in a situation of its own making mm. or not of its own making. Like it wasn't, it it was bred to do something that it is fundamentally unnatural and mm -hmm. unsustainable. And now it's not like a lion's gonna come take care of this problem now that it's the weakest member of the herd. It's just gonna wither and die and either, not making a choice, like not choosing not to do something about it is also an ethical choice. Yeah, yeah. And so it forces you to reckon with things that, yeah, living in the city, you know, you don't, how many people put a, put aside, like see a, a person die. How many people see literally anything die? Right, yeah. Their whole life. Yeah, yeah. You just hear about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we um, you know, we have chickens and, you know, um, we can let them free range yeah. so that they're natural and out in sure. the fields and, you know, foraging for insects. But then guess who else is, is foraging? Yeah. The bobcats sure. and the hawks. So, you know, you have to make these choices, right? Are you going to 
close them in, smothering mother, like protect them, you know, sure. in their life, but make them suffer in a cage. You know, it's it's I had not to, easy. I, I heard a noise on the porch last night and there was five raccoons on my porch. Ooh, those, and it was like- They're brutal, those guys. My, uh, we had slowly been watching the chickens disappear. We assumed it was something like that. That's who it was. And then it was like, uh, now I have this decision. What am I going to do about the mm. raccoons? And uh, I ended up, I, it was actually funny. My wife grabbed a shoe and she threw it at them and it knocked them over like bowling pins. It was like the most comical thing I've ever <laughs> seen. And then they all scampered away and I'll, like, I'll, have to, I'll just do a trap like tonight and I'll move them or whatever. But um, yeah, you realize, hey, you, this, this choice that feels kind, say like not locking up the chickens uh-huh. is perhaps not kind right or you because it's not like you didn't breed like somebody bred them to be totally unprotected un um able to defend themselves i mean god made them food yeah <laughs> I mean, right the, the food for you or food for something yeah something um so you you but but either way you just get used to you have 10 chickens and then you have eight chickens. Yeah. And then and then what's also revealing or interesting about it, I remember we we had this goose, uh, we had a couple of geese and uh, geese are hilarious mm-hmm. and really fun. And they would live sort of on the pond and then they would come in. And like the, fir- the first time one of the geese got attacked, we like took it to the vet, paid a bunch of money yeah. to get yeah. it like, you know, fixed up or whatever. And then like a week later it gets, you know, taken and, I, we were more sad than the other geese, which did not give a shit. Right. And and you realize like animals have come to cope with the fact that somebody gets picked off on a regular basis mm-hmm. and that they don't feel sorry for themselves about it. No, they're in they the have, moment. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I So uh, you, you're gonna have to come. We're gonna, okay. so we, we, what do you do about snakes? Um, well, it depends if, we have chickens and it's a problem for the chickens, like the eggs or whatever, or whatever. Um, it also depends on what kind of snake it is. If it's a rat snake, um, usually I'll hope it'll just sort of move on and go away. Please you, go. Yeah, Please. you can also, um, <laughs> you just put a fake egg out or a golf ball and then they disappear because uh-huh. they eat that. And die. Yes. Oh, so you kill them. So, so that's one thing you can do. Um, or um, oh my god, yeah. <laughs> this is where we might diverge. Okay, so you like <laughs> you like snakes? I'm not a snake person. So when I first moved to the land, you know, you start to realize um, either you're going to call someone to come handle the snake, which is like ridiculous because by yeah. the time they show up, the snake's anywhere yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to pay somebody to do that, or you do it yourself, yeah. right? Um, and the question is, what are you going to do? Yeah. You're going to kill every snake you you see sure i tried that you know cut off the head of one with a shovel rattlesnake um i didn't know at the time i mean it looked like a snake it was just a scary snake you know (laughs) and i was like this is not sustainable i was heartbroken and and then you know you just deliberate with yourself and you start to realize okay this if i kill every single snake that's just that's a lot of murder yeah you know so Mm -hmm. I, I, I learned to wrangle the snakes. I learned to... Wow. What did you, like a stick or something? Yeah, yeah, with yeah. A, just a long yeah. clasp, is, you know, with the handle on Because the they end. go in your chicken coop and they eat the eggs and they I, eat I've, the chickens. I've, yeah, I've had to yeah. take one out of the chicken coop. Yeah. And I actually had some um, mouse traps in our chicken coop because those I will kill. That's where the I draw mice? one. My, yeah. Because they will Although the snakes procreate. kill the mice. That's true. That's true. Uh, but there needs to be some balance, right? Yes. Obviously, but and they're not going for this, the the rats or the mice. They're going for the chicken eggs, which we eat. Yeah. So, um, but I had some mouse traps in the chicken coop because there was an infestation. Yeah. And um, when I went to go op- take off this the box where the mouse trap was in, because yeah. you have to There's protect. Yeah, you have to protect the chickens from the mouse trap. They're dumb. They'll eat anything. I, I t- put, pick up the box and there was a snake that would have tagged me right then, yeah. but it was in the mouse trap. Yeah. So I had to free the snake yeah. in order to capture it and then relocate it. Right. So I was getting into relocation for a long time. But then the question is, where do you relocate them to? Right. Because if you take them 
a mile or two away. I mean, you're just going to basically release them into someone's yard. Yeah, somebody else's problem. <laughs> you know, there's not a lot yeah. of wild areas here. You're technically not allowed to go to like uh, the Bastrop uh, the park or something. Park, right? Yeah. Technically, I'm not not to say that I did or I didn't. I might have, but where are you going to where are you going to take sure. it? And if you take it too far, they'll actually die anyway because they're too far from their habitat. Sure. Um, and if you relocate them close by, they'll just show up again. So yeah. I've come to the point where I'm just letting them be entirely. And um, now that I have a kid, it, it's it making it, it makes me feel a certain way. Yeah. But at the same time, I just if I can create enough balance on the land, as you said, and and leave them alone and be mindful, sure, be present in the moment. I find snakes to be a reminder to pay you can't attention. Tune out. Sure, because sometimes if I'm walking like and there's a snake, I'm like, oh, whew, boom! Suddenly, it I'm, makes you feel I'm there. Fear. You realize at a very primal level you are feeling and aware of things that you are just not in a regular like we have we have a relationship with snakes yes. that goes way back yes yes <laughs> all the way back to the first of us <laughs> yeah yeah no i i'm 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 more that way now and definitely uh samantha's that way except for rattlesnakes copperheads or um uh what's the other one um cottonmouth is it cottonmouth uh, sky mouth. Yeah, what, there's like a handful of poisonous snakes. Mm-hmm. So when I see those, I usually take care of it. I have mm-hmm. a, I have um, there's like snake shot in a pistol mm-hmm. that you can do, or a, like a rifle. I'll, sometimes I'll just do that. But I, I how hard is it to hit them? Well, so snake shot, it's like you know, like a shotgun shell. Like it's oh, I see like that. But it's a, it's a small. It's like a 22 shell that shoots like a, a round of BBs that's maybe like this big. So no. you only have to, you have to just be in the ballpark. Mm-hmm. But this is like this is like a once a year occurrence. For the most part, they slither away, or uh, they're going to cancel you, man. You better be careful of shooting snakes. Someone's going to cancel you out there. <laughs> uh, I feel like snakes are the are one of the few remaining things that the majority of people uh, feel disgust and disdain for. Yeah, I mean, I kill cockroaches. Yeah, yeah, co- that's up there too. And mice, mice and cockroaches are definitely on the kill list. Yeah, well, the the mice attract the snakes, unfortunately. So, the, it's that's you realize you're just creating this sort of ecosystem, mm-hmm. and like you would right. like it to be perfect and only conducive to what you want. But yeah. your chicken coop is attracting all these and, other things. And ants, particularly when they're in your house, like flies. They gotta go. Flies, yeah, yeah. maggots, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> Um, although you know you could eat them, I guess. Right? What? Oh, the, so you, you feed the feed, feed the flies to the chickens. Yes. So do do you have? Um, I, I imagine you have a lot of grasshoppers. Yes. Right, because uh-huh. they're they're rampant. They're, they're yeah, yeah. invasive. It's like a locust. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So what I've been doing is riding around on the buggy with a net, <laughs> capturing them. You just dr- drive fast enough. And yeah. yeah. Just, no, just, like when you're driving, you'll they come up, they'll like hit you in the face. Yeah. It's ever, yeah, yeah. They'll jump on you. Yeah. But it, but you gather okay. them in the net on the way to the like chicken Like a butterfly coop. net or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you feed it to the I chickens? I feed them to the chickens. I do that with scorpions whenever we catch like... Scor- do you ever get scorpions in your house? You know, we haven't. I've seen a couple dead babies, but not any live... Nothing... You know. Scor- like chickens, yeah, they'll eat. Like Wait. if I catch like a frog in the pool, I throw it to the chickens, they eat that. Mm-hmm. Um, black widows. Yeah, anything. Chickens will eat anything. Yeah. But they won't eat the ants. Yeah, that, I've always wondered that. Guys, Why is come that? on. Eat I know. These no, ants. there's like a giant ant mound like five feet from where my chickens are. Have you ever done the thing? I, I've I've only seen videos of it where you dump like mercury or silver or something. Like, they dump like a molten metal in an anthill. Yeah, you mean to create the mold of it? Yeah, and then yeah, it's yeah. like this weird sculpture mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. You did that? No, no, no. Oh. I, oh. Seems expensive slash dangerous. Yeah. So we we have um, leaf cutter ants. Yeah. And do you, I don't think those are cool. You have? I've seen them. Yeah. Like where you, where they've cut like a whole trail and they're whole they're carrying carrying stuff. the leaves. Yeah, it's the coolest thing. But they'll take down a whole. So we have a food forest and they've taken yeah. down a whole tree in a night. Wow. So we are not. You know, fucking with those. No, we do not. And and. <laughs> I've just been trying so many different ways to get rid of them. And of course, natural, you know, we don't want to use, you know, um, pesticides and, and, you know, so it's tough. It's very yeah. tough. 
and you're part of that thing, that, you know, cycle of life. And you, my friend, they're indifferent to you in your food forest. <laughs> when I wrote The Daily Stoic eight years ago, I had this crazy idea that I would just keep it going. The book was 366 meditations, but I'd write one more every single day and I'd give it away for free as an email. I thought maybe a few people would sign up. Couldn't have even comprehended a future in which three quarters of a million people would get this email every single day and would for almost a decade. If you wanna get the email, if you wanna be part of a community that is the largest group of Stoics ever assembled in human history, I'd love for you to join us. You can sign up and get the email totally for free. No spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want at dailystoic.com slash email. There's a Stoic philosopher, his name is Musonius Rufus, and he said, the only profession suitable to a philosopher is farming which I thought was interesting and I didn't really get at first. And then you realize just all the different ways that it challenges you ethically, morally, it challenges your patience, it challenges your, um, you know, it, 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 it connects you with nature, it forces you to be present. It does, it does all these, it, it brings you, yeah. through all these weird philosophical principles, which you wouldn't think that like growing stuff or raising cattle or just taking care of the land or fixing fences would draw out mm. of you, but it does. Yes, chop wood, carry water. Yeah. Yeah, so how do you how do you find the balance? Because you're still in the yeah. previous world on some level, Yeah. You're still doing the media game. And I, I, I had a question for you about, um, well, where do you start? How do you find the balance between your foyer into farming and ranching and still staying in it with regards to writing yeah, and all that. That the the hard part is like there is something satisfying about doing it yourself. And then there's also like How did long you get it takes. Did you yeah, did you get this thing to like take you away from your other things? Like I remember yeah. when we first had kids, I was I, it was at a different place, I had a lot going on. But I'd be like, I'd be like, wait, I just spent the whole day clearing brush. Mm -hmm. You know, which was like satisfying and physically, you know, invigorating, but also like my wife was inside with our four month old and maybe that's not the best use of my time. So I, I try to balance it. I do, I did, I, I've gotten to a place where also I don't feel insecure about it anymore in the sense that like, if I don't do it and I pay someone to do it, I don't feel like I'm- But you've like done it at than, least the first time. Yeah, I, that I've done most of it and I could do it if I wanted yeah. to. Like, like we just had a, a good chunk of our fencing replaced, like the barbed wire, cause it was really old. I can replace barbed wire and I have hung barbed wire, but like, do I need to hang several thousand feet of barbed wire? And am I gonna do as good a job as people who this is their thing. So I, I think there's a there's a tension in, in farming, but in all facets of life of like delegating versus um, being like a control mm -hmm. freak. Yeah, I, I just think it's a slippery slope, right? I, I, I was distinctly in my other life um, climbing the capitalist ladder. Sure so that I could have more money to have more free time, to be more bougie, to have yeah. more brunches yeah. and and get more soft, mm -hmm. you know? And that was, and I was quite good at it. Yeah, right? I was, you can get quite soft. I was quite, <laughs> you know, I, I was weak. Yeah. I was, I, I had very little skills. I had some skills which, you know, got me a media career. Yeah. But I had no um, skills as a, as a man, as a, you know, um, I mean, we listen, we don't have to, as a man, I'm just going to yeah. say it. And now I have to make up for lost time. Mm. And so in many ways I do the work because it's, it is fulfilling and invigorating. Um, but also because I, I want to make sure that I'm still in it. I let, like I'm, I have an embodied experience yeah. as opposed to just everything being abstract and in, in my head and then letting other people do the work. So it is a balance because you lay a thousand feet of barbed wire and then you clear the brush that there, there's your week, right? Yeah, sure. Not to mention all the other things you have to do. Um, so I was, I was the same in that I was, I want to do it all and I'm going to do it all myself. And yeah. I was just 
untenable. Like it just doesn't make sense. So can I continue every day to do something yeah. and be present in my body on the land, in nature, doing the work, getting sweaty, building calluses, and also leave room for scalability by bringing in community, bringing in others and supporting them to participate as well. So I think, yeah, it's a balance for sure. That's something I've been thinking about as a parent, which is weird. Like you, you, people go like, oh, I'm gonna mow my own lawn. I'm gonna change my own oil. Um, th there's this idea of like, I wanna do everything myself. Mm -hmm. And, but the one thing people are very quick to outsource is the care of their children, yes. which I've always thought is so strange. So yes. it's like, you'll hand off your kid to this stranger for hours a day. So that you can go mow your own lawn. Yeah. <laughs> and, or, or like you'll, if I was like, you know what, you should you should hire an assistant. And you go, I can't afford that. Like that's very expensive. Um, or there's this sort of reluctant to like staff up in a business or a freelance or whatever. And then you'll have that same person will have babysitters and nannies or what, like so they we, can do it, we, yeah. we, we staff, people are very comfortable with staff in all the senses of that word for the most precious thing they have in the world mm -hmm. and then are very possessive of things that don't matter at all, mm. that don't say anything about you. So like my main thing is I like to spend like a lot of time with my kids. And so I'll pay people to do other shit and I don't feel insecure about that at all. Like I, that doesn't make me feel like less than mm -hmm. a man uh, that that I'm looking out and someone's like outside getting sweaty doing something for me because like I'm I'm playing Legos with my boys mm -hmm. um, or we're traveling or whatever. So I, I I I think the balance of like you could do it, you know how to do it. These are all very important yeah. skills. And then there is this sense of like people prioritize very strange things that are tied to their identity. And then they accept as a given that like someone else should be doing the childcare, yeah, which yeah. I, I've, no, has I, always struck me as very strange. Yeah, one, part of the impetus for me in, in, in my homesteading journey was about um, not outsourcing my life to the world. Yeah but being a part of it, like sure. living it. Like sure. I get to live my life. I mm -hmm. get to, and really finding this balance of how do we choose community? How do we choose, um, you know, cause our, our fragmented culture forces us to outsource many of these jobs that were traditionally f f part of the family. Like your mom would be, or your parents would be living with you or aunts and uncles and they'd sure. help you with the kids as opposed to now you gotta pay some stranger to, to come in and do that. While that stranger has their kid, you know, in some daycare. Sure. And you're just right. like, you're not taking care of your kids to take care of our kids and we're paying you so that we can do something else. It, it's backwards. So recalibrating all of these things is important. And it's not that you, do it all and you and you just um, don't let anybody else touch any your lawn or your kids but it's about reintroducing yourself to what it's like to do it yeah so that you can then find the right balance you and I have a similar journey that we both sort of were on either like a rocket ship or we've gotten to the top of something that a lot of people would want to get to the top of and then we both sort of stepped away so what was that for you? Like, what were you running away from or what were you walking towards? Like, why, why, not, why not just continue what you were doing? That must have seemed totally insane to a lot of people. Because I was, I was on the wrong track. Mm -hmm. I was definitely on the wrong path of life. I was um, selfish, narcissistic, indulgent, you know, bougie as fuck. And I was... I, I, I had an awakening I saw my future and I realized I was gonna be utterly alone. Mm. Um, I had no family, I was in my early 40s. My, my girlfriend dumped me because I was a prick. And, and it was like rock bottom. I was like, holy shit, like I'm, I, I've spent all this time building up this life and so that I could strategically place dopamine hit opportunities throughout the day, whether it's, you know, drugs and alcohol, you know, partying, sex, and all these things that would take me out of myself. Sure. You know, and so I was escaping presence and feeling, numbing. And then I, I sort of hit a rock bottom. I was like, I got to change everything. And I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. It just meant that I had to strip away, start to reduce all of the, the lifestyle um, things that I had built 
the, the houses, the, you know, the, the parties and the travel and everything and just get really small. And that's when I, um, I took my house in Austin and I moved in the backyard because I was renting it out at the yeah. time to some young guys. And I, um, I basically, I, I moved into the trailer that I had in the backyard and I lived there for a year, um, basically meditating and reading and exploring who I am and what I want to be and learning to make my own choices for the first time in my life. Sure. You know, I, oh, well, I have to do this job because it's, it's going to pay me all this money and take me around the world. But what's the, you know, what's... For what? Or for why? what? Yeah, yeah. Like, and what's that going to... Sure, I have more money, more escape, more, you know, people applauding me, but who am I? I remember I had a conversation with Tim Ferriss once and he he was like he was like i have a question for you i was like okay he's like what do you do with your money and i was like what do you mean and I, was, I was like is this like an investment question he's like no he's like when you have money what do you spend it on he's like you know do you have like a speedboat do you like do he was like what do you spend the money mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. and i was like like nothing like, i don't really there's not like things that i spend it on i right. just like just goes you buy this, you buy real estate yeah well no it, go, it just goes in this account and then the number gets higher right, right? like yeah, yeah. i just save it i don't like I have more than I need is basically what I was saying. And he was like, okay, so you should, he was like, make sure you make business decisions accordingly. And that was like super helpful to me because you, there is this sense, like, again, if you don't know what you want, you want what other people want. And what most people want is more. They want more money. They want lots mm -hmm. of money. Mm -hmm. They want to get to some place where they have the most or so mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. or an unlimited amount. And if that's not important to you, realizing that is incredibly freeing because then you don't have to do things that you don't want to do yeah, or that you shouldn't do. And then it makes it easier to say no to things. Yeah. It's still very hard, especially yeah, yeah. when there's a large number attached to the thing that people are offering you. But knowing like, here's the kind of thing that I want to do. So I'm going to say yes to those things. And then pretty much everything else I don't need to say yes to mm -hmm. because it doesn't give me what I want. And so there've been a, a handful of pivotal moments where like someone offered me something very, very cool, even if it wasn't financial, but it, it would it would mean moving here or giving up this or spent, not spending time with these people and going, that might be success by some traditional definition, but it's the opposite of the life that I want. Mm -hmm. And so I can confidently pass so many people are driving with the, the brake on, you know, they, they're doing all these things, but it's actually keeping them from what they want. Right. So yeah. it's like, you're just creating a gulf between you and, and your, your true self. Yeah. Um, and I, when my g growth journey converged with the pandemic. Mm -hmm, me too. And that was another thing. I was like, holy shit. Like I was in my trailer when the pandemic hit and I was like, Phew. I got this. Yeah. Like I don't need anything. I was lit I had no I was cooking on an open flame, you know, in a little fire yeah. in the backyard. Yeah. And living in a camper. I was like, I don't need all the things. And and people were struggling because yeah. all of a sudden everything that they had or their job or whatever, it's like now they have to do without and stay inside and, and be confronted with self. So for me, the pandemic was like confirmation like you're on the right path yeah it was it, it was a wake-up call for me it was like oh i like where i live i like my life and now because some other things were taken away like all my speaking got canceled yes. all this stuff went away and it was like now i i have to spend time doing the thing that actually i want to do yes my writing got better my family life got better and yeah. all these things and it, i know this can feel very glib because so many people actually did suffer and lose all these things but yeah there but it's a wake-up call for a culture as of course. well yeah. but but it's this idea of like a lot of people spend a lot of time doing things that are actually taking them a further away from where they want to go or what they actually like. And it's, it's, this is an out of necessity. If you're, if you're working three jobs because you're a single mom supporting your family, that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about someone who says they're doing it all for their family. And so they're working, you know, 18 hour days on wall street or at some law firm to someday be able to not do that thing mm -hmm. to do the thing that they actually have right now. Like I remember mm -hmm. I was talking to this guy who is an author and um, 
he had all these connections. So anyways, he gets he gets this opportunity to run this like VC fund mm -hmm. and he raises like a hundred million dollars for this VC fund, which is a ton of money. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but let's walk through this. Like, let's say your VC fund over the next seven years succeeds. Oh, it it's succeeds. huge. So you walk away, let's say you make $20 million, right. $25 million, which when would be insane. Um, when, 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 you, when you have succeeded at this thing, what will you do then? Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, I'll blah, blah, blah. It boils down to, he would go back to writing books, right? And so I was like, okay, so basically you're hoping to pull off this million to one shot. You're gonna spend every waking hour trying to do this incredibly difficult competitive thing. Mm -hmm. You're gonna try to not just beat the market, but beat all the other people trying to beat the market. Mm -hmm. And you're, you, you, what you will do with what you have won, with your winnings, will be effectively to go back and do what you are already doing. Mm -hmm. And there's that, there's that old email that gets forwarded around, but actually it's this story about a, a king. Like there's a story of like a, a fisherman in Vietnam or something. Right, that, you yeah, know, right. that, that's actually a story about it. The real story dates back to like the 14 or 1500s. It's this king and this advisor goes, you know, we should invade this country and then invade this country and invade this country and invade this country, conquer all of them. And then, then we can live at peace. But they're at peace now, right? <laughs> and so there is this sense where people do a lot of things mm. to get to a position that's actually much more accessible and realistic mm. right now than they think it is. Yeah, and and as opposed to developing the appreciation for the small things, the simple things, yeah. you know, the, the immediate the immediacy of your 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 situation. And not to say you shouldn't strive, but to to build resilience. And that's one thing. Like now I know, like as you were saying before, I don't I'm not so afraid of having to achieve and make all this money and climb that ladder because I know that I can be quite happy with very little. Yes. You know, so it gives me a lot more freedom and it's in in and and I, I have the power of choice in the moment without having to make any any choice that would be f simply for the money yeah you know because i can always i can always fall back on my s fence mending <laughs> skills and yeah do it myself and especially with the, with the pandemic and the uncertainty of the future and the fragility of our centralized economic system if everything collapses tomorrow i can survive your spread's a little fancier than mine, but sometimes I think, so we have this nice big piece of property. It looks out over this this lake, which is really a tank, as you learn. <laughs> right, yes. Our, mine is not spring-fed like yours. I don't have the <laughs> river, but um, it's beautiful, right? I look out I, I look out my back window or my bedroom window, I step on the porch, I'm like, this is incredible. I can't believe I, you know, I, I have worked so hard and gotten so lucky and earned these things that this is mine. But my adjoining neighbor has, like three acres that are effectively worthless and they live in a very small old trailer, but they have the same view. They have yeah. my view, right? Yeah. Like they look at my property. And so like, that was one of the things that I, I like, I reminded myself of during the pandemic, you know, like we were spending all this time together alone. We had security and I didn't have to worry about money. Unlike a lot of people, I felt very blessed, you know, walking around and then I'd go, you know, uh, so much of even this is superfluous. Like again, my next door neighbor or this person, this person, they have the same thing that I have at a much more excess, like I could fall many levels, like many rungs mm -hmm. down the ladder and still be good. And when you realize that it gives you, I think some security and confidence to, to be like, man, I don't really wanna do that. Like, or I'm yeah. not, I don't care about that. I'm not going to get in that game. Like the or that ability race. to say no is a very powerful thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You think you need, you know, people, I remember I interviewed this guy who's this tech entrepreneur and he, he talks about how all these people are working very, very hard trying to pull off very difficult things to get fuck you money. Yeah. Right. And he's like, I've met a lot of people who are doing that, who have done it. And he was like, I have not heard very many people say fuck you. So yeah, you, you, that's think, funny. you think that getting this thing is going to make you more independent, more secure, more, you know, um, aggressive in the risks that you take and the mm -hmm. stands that you take, you know, just all the things that you do. But that, the, in fact, the exact opposite happens. Mm -hmm. Usually becoming successful makes you more conservative, not just politically, but just like 
now you have it and you know how hard it was to get it. And so you don't want to lose it. Mm-hmm. And so you, so you end up working harder. You end up doing more Then you have this, you have this stake and you're like, what's well, got to grow at this percentage a year. Or, you know, if I, if I don't spend it, then, then in 20 years, it'll be worth, you know, X. Right. And so it, you think that getting this stuff is going to get you to this place that's different. And in, in fact, it just gets you to a place that's more like the insecure place that you started at. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm just hearing a lot of people being like, oh, easy for you to say, right? Um, keeping up with inflation ain't nothing, right? And Sure. Um, w- so I guess... I'm, I'm just trying to like... I remember someone told me like, you know, your money doesn't have to grow, <laughs> right? It just shouldn't run out, right? Like, I mean, it should and you should be savvy. But there, there is also though, I think, and again, these are sort of privileged sam- champagne problems, but people get to a place where they feel like getting it isn't enough. Right, yeah. Then it, then they have to grow it and double it, triple it yeah. or whatever. And so it creates this immense amount of insecurity. The whole point of success, the whole point of financial success should be that you don't think about money that much. Right, yeah. And then you, you talk to people who have extraordinary amounts of money and all they talk about is money and their whole life still revolves around money. Do they... Where are they on the Forbes list? You know, how are their investments doing? Um, can they afford this new fancy thing or whatever? And and um, there's a poverty in that. Yeah, yeah. I I think I, I think I was uh, unlearning that myself. Yeah. You know, always needing more, the next thrill, the, the next high, as opposed to just really. you know whittling it reducing it all down yeah to just the bare essence of being yeah you know and and being happy with that yeah being content with that because there's a lot of people who ha- have a lot who are very discontent and then there are people who have very little who are also discontent sure. like they're not recognizing what they do have yeah you know because it because obviously flash over all media it's like you you need more 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 you know, entourage is the goal. Yeah. Um, versus what stories we tell ourselves. Yeah. Is is so important. And and you know about this, you know, from media f- literacy. It's like you you have to be careful what you consume, what you sure. what you watch. No, it can what break it your tells brain. you about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No, this what is you, yeah, go this ahead. is very true as parents, right? So mm, like yeah, oh yeah. You good. follow these accounts that give you a sense of how other parents are doing or what like what their life looks like and it's not realistic at all like like i've never seen a single like sort of parenting mom or dad instagram account where the house wasn't spotless right, yeah. i've never seen one where the kids are crying and screaming and yelling where the parents are stressed where they haven't showered like it looks perfect and that's not what it looks like and it's definitely not what my house looks like <laughs> shit and so now you, you tell me <laughs> you you have like this idea of like who are you trying to impress? What image are you trying to keep up? Like if you can get in this sort of algorithmic loop that's making you feel inadequate and shitty all the time, and this can happen to you if you're a 12 year old girl, or it can happen to you if you're a 50 year old man who thinks that the truck that you or I drive is cool. And then then you see somebody else driving an insert fancy car mm-hmm. and you go, well, I don't have that. Am I, am, did I make the wrong decision? Am I not? Do I not have what they, it's not good for the brain to like keeping up with the Jones is a very natural thing. So you have to be very diligent about what Joneses you let in your Mm. life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's tough with the algorithms who are telling you what Joneses you, you, you want in your life. Yeah. So I, um, I saw an Instagram account and I, there was a tip on how to change a diaper to avoid blowouts. Yeah. And so, I was doing it for the longest time and I kept getting blowouts. And finally, Jordan, she looked at the way I was doing it and I was doing it totally wrong. I was like folding it under. And I think it might've been a prank. Like someone probably (laughs) put that out there to just fuck with parents and (laughs) increase blowouts. Yeah, or who knows? Maybe they're just an idiot or like a crazy person or whatever. Yeah, you you have no idea. Yeah, we had too much trust in in what you see. You know, I I saw it. Of course it's, you know, it's, 
so it's funny we we are very much like um because you did a lot of uh, work in uh, media uh, critique. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've seen Teenage Paparazzo. Have you seen no. my film? So that's basically a, a media literacy film yeah. from the eyes of a celebrity. Sure. And I basically um, turn the cameras onto a paparazzo who's 13 years old. Yeah. And he's an aspiring paparazzi, you know, taking pictures. What a strange thing to And it became to. this, yeah, it became this... Um, Hall of Mirrors, like sure. this frac frac fractured, you know, um, media landscape where everyone's taking pictures of everybody and everybody's striving to be what I had, yeah. and I'm trying to deconstruct it. I I, I, I urge you to check it I out will. because I think you'll see that we're we have yet another <laughs> thing in common. Well, you were working on a documentary about Dove at one point, weren't you? Well, the and then there's that. Room? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I remember. I remember hearing about that. And uh, well, it was it, I was trying to do a narrative series. Oh, about him? Yeah, like a like fictional. Fictional, yeah, yeah. like a written. I was gonna play Dove. Yeah, and I just needed him to give me his his life rights and his trust. Yeah, so that I could go make a series about him. And obviously, you could do all the salacious stuff, because um, you know we share. You yeah. you worked with Dove, yeah. and I I was friendly with him. Um, in trying to make this this project, but I really wanted to 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 make a a show that would not uh, not vindicate him, but really show the contradictions yes. within the fashion industry that would look at a guy like Dove Charney and shame him and um, make him this perverted figure. When if you look across fashion. It's there's a lot of perversion. Well, there and there's different kinds of perversions, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, hey, the decision to do these like slightly pornographic or yes. risque or controversial ads, that's one that's one area that someone could say, ethically, I don't like that. But that same person has a 17-year-old girl working, you know, 10 hours a day in an air, you know, in a windowless factory that could collapse by earthquake at any moment, making 50 cents an hour. Oh, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So like there's different forms of exploitation totally. and the exploitation that is visible mm -hmm. and titillating or, you know, sexual in some way that like really stands out to people. But I remember he said once to me, I, he would go like, he said something like, if you're buying a swimsuit for $8, somebody got fucked. You know, like his point was like, you can't do that. Right. In any ethical, um, non-exploitative, cruel way. Yeah. And we as a society have totally taken that for granted, that that's what things should cost. And for the same reason, we don't think about where our food comes from. We don't, we don't want to think about just how inherently exploitative and awful most of the clothes mm -hmm. or items we wear, where they come from. 100%, yeah, yeah. So I guess he was one of the early figures that you know was, was being canceled. And yes. this is pre Me Too. Yes. So he was sort of getting away with it for the, for, to a large degree. And then Me Too just well, undermined. He's also a fascinating figure. I think it's a very common thing that like super talented, super successful people, they have the thing that makes them great. And then they have the demon or the wound. Which is usually that, the same. Which is usually the same yeah. and ultimately destroys them yeah. after it's propelled them to some height. You know, like there's something, I, I one one of the things I came to understand was like the American apparel girl which was so iconic and fascinating and popular, like his image, mm -hmm. like the thing he was upset, his like Gatsby-esque, like that's the, like it wasn't just this thing he found aesthetically pleasing. There was something, there was some, like that must have been the girl that he was in love with in high school and could never get because of who he was. Mm -hmm. And so, Later, after he'd achieved all this incredible success and had so much going for him, the fact that he would risk all of that, you know, legally, ethically, morally, yeah. just plain self-control, that he would that he couldn't stop himself and wouldn't stop himself mm -hmm. when they said, 
Dove, you will lose everything yeah. if you have another relationship with a person who works for you. <laughs> you know, like um, Josh Peck actually interviewed him. He he asked if I would connect. You know, who Josh Peck is. Yeah. Um, he interviewed and he was like, dude, he's like, Dove, like I'm gonna describe a situation to you. He's like, you cannot eat peanuts, right? And he's like. If you eat, if you touch one more peanut, you will lose everything, right? You know, he's just talking metaphorically, and Dove mm -hmm. goes, "I should be able to have sex with whoever I want." Like Dove yeah, couldn't yeah, even yeah. metaphorically right. wrap his head around the idea that there's some things yeah, yeah. that you can't do, and so yeah. he destroys. He he's when Dove was following his sort of <clears throat> ethical north star mm -hmm. of like fashion companies shouldn't yeah. fuck people over yeah. and clothes can be like. It don't have to ruin the environment. Like when he had this sort of sense, this vision mm -hmm. for what creatively and um, sort of um, structurally was possible, yeah. like as an entrepreneur, he was amazing. Totally. And then when he was driven by the, like the opposite of his North Star, which is his dick, he right. was well, whatever, a monster. Whatever hole inside yes. him, you know, um, American Apparel Girl hole sized hole in his heart, yes. right? And Rosebud. Yes, you it's know, a rosebud thing for him, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I mean, and and he's brilliant. So he's a he's definitely a flawed hero. Like that's how I saw him—a flawed hero in a culture that um, is just as fucked as him, but get, gets away with it because they have all the you know sexual harassment rules in in the workplace. I mean, even on Entourage, right? So like, my relationship to sex was partly cultivated by entourage because that's what know? the character's lifestyle was right and i yeah. be, and the, the more i became the character the more um uh, uh, approval i got from people and women and the more i started to become that character and live that lifestyle so i had a different relationship with sex um and quite unhealthy where i was like yeah what you know there's people are so uptight there's so so, so, so there's such puritanical culture sure. still um, and I heard yet, Dove make these rants. What's that? I've heard Dove make these 100%, rants. 100%. Yeah. And I understood him. I yeah. was like, yeah, you know, yeah. you're honest. You're you're like, you're like wearing it on your sleeve. Like people know who you are. Yeah. So, and um, I guess I'm a lot more conservative now. And I've found my own pious um, take on, on well, love and relationships. It's bad for you. Like it's well, bad you for you. Yes. Like there's yes. that saying like fame is a mask that eats at the face. Yes. And like, most and anything that is in control of you rather than you being in control of it is this right. dangerous road to go down and right. and i think and you do hurt people too yeah, like of you, you, it's bad for you but then look at what yes. you're doing to the people around you and you know you, you know alcohol for example is is destructive self-destructive yeah. but then it also starts to hurt your family right if you're if if you're off the deep end. Yeah. Same with any vice. And I, you know, I learned those lessons and I, you know, have come back to center. And now I, you know, I, I truly feel like I've been rehabilitated. Um, but I, I, I don't know if Dove ever hit rock bottom enough to see himself in those ways. I remember Robert Green and I were talking to him once. We're like, Dove, you need like a hobby. Like you need to like run or swim or do something. And he's like, I have a hobby. And we're like, what is it? And he was like, sex. Like sex is not a hobby. Sex is a vice, <laughs> right? It's not that it's always bad, but sex is a vice, right. and and or it at best, it's a thing to procreate with yes. to make family. It it, yeah. con it consumed his life, and what's crazy about Dove the, the idea that he didn't hit rock bottom. I mean, like literally everything was taken for he lost. He not just lost the company, but like he owes one of the hedge funds that he used to try to regain control of the company, he owes them $20 million. And like, even then, he's, he's not changed a single habit. Yeah, yeah. And like, is it, the world can blow you up and then you can decide, you have two, you have two choices there, mm -hmm. right? It's like, you hit that rock bottom and you can decide to, to climb your way out or yeah. you can keep digging. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you know, Dove is now running Kanye West's company? No. Yes. He's a wow. Jewish man who is running the fashion company of a virulent anti-Semite slash profoundly ill person. Like I think what Kanye West has done is, they found each is, other. is unforgivable and awful. 
and sad. And then also like clearly not a sane, healthy, like something like th there's, there's something there that I don't want to say takes him off the hook, but like he's, he's a victim of what's happening to him also. And the, the yeah. fact that they found each other. And I, I was just talking to someone the other day. I was like, I can't imagine what their meetings are like. Like the two of them, because yes. I'm sure you were around Going Dunmore, he would rails. just talk for like five hours. Yeah, he's super entertaining. Yeah. I actually started drinking um, lukewarm coffee, lukewarm instant coffee because of him. Yeah, Dev, was a, Dev didn't do any drugs, but what he would do is, and Robert Green told me he was doing this literally as he was being fired from American Apparel, he would get a cup of cold water yeah, yeah. and then he would open a pack of uh, like a Nescafe pod yeah. that you're supposed to put like through a machine. This is like a, a like a yeah. curing <laughs> cup. And he would just pour basically straight caffeine yeah. into a cup of water and then just drink it. Mm -hmm. um, because he was he he was in such a manic phase all the time. He just needed it to kind of keep it going or maybe he was even he may have even been taking the caffeine to come down from his like natural mm -hmm. insanity. I remember a lot of times he would just call me at like three in the morning and I would realize he was just calling me as he was falling asleep. Like he he was so lonely and had so mm. like, like the idea of even whatever the women he was around, like he didn't actually like them. Yeah. Or spend, he was just calling to hear a voice so that he would not be alone with his mm. own thoughts for the two minutes before he passed out, having been awake for 36 hours straight. Yeah, yeah. It's terrible. I mean, you just realize it, a lot of these people that you think you want to be like, you do not want to be like. Flawed hero, a tragedy nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I wish I could have made that that show. Um, I think so. His favorite novel was this book. You think he'd give me the rights now? I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. It, and that was the thing too, is I was like, Dove, what... What could I do? What could I? What story could I tell that isn't already out there? Yeah, you know, six ways to Sunday. Yeah, I'm actually going to tell a more nuanced story about your your full range of complexity. You're going to be the best, nicest person to do it. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I just don't know if I could do it now, but um, it's one of those uh, you know nine unfinished things in my heart that I wish that it would have happened. He he loved the story of Duddy Kravitz. Yes, know. yes. The, yeah. Yeah, who's like shamed for having a boner or something. Uh, <laughs> may, yeah, that might, like, that might be the beginning. The, Daddy Kravitz, there's also a movie with Richard Dreyfuss where he plays Daddy Kravitz. It's like a great movie, but he, it's about this sort of hustling young Jewish kid in Montreal who like he hears from his grandfather that don't, that like a man owns land. Funny what we're talking about. It's like a man owns land. That was like the mark of success. They came from nothing. And Duddy becomes this sort of hustler. He starts with like arcade games and he trades his way up till he's really successful. And then he ends up like hurting or betraying his best friend to like get the land. Like his friend ends up in a wheelchair, basically does literally anything to get the success. And then he, you know, he takes his grandfather to see the land but his grandfather has heard what he's done to get it. And Duddy can't, can't understand slash accept that like he, he can't, he can't understand that some things are worth more than other things. And your self-respect, your honor, your values yeah. are more important than the success. And there, the irony for Dove to have loved that movie and that story, he probably never read the book. He probably only watched the movie, but it's like, he, it's like he only watched the first two acts and he like missed the mm. turn uh, where it, it's Mom, a cautionary Dove, the tale. plays the thing, man. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, it's like missing that Gatsby dies at the end of Great Gatsby. You know, like he ends up floating right. in a pool, murdered. Right. And, but all you saw was the cool Party, parties. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, that's who I want to be. Yeah, that's hilarious. I, I always liked, so the opening of the show as I saw it was Dove at eight years old. Yeah. I don't know if he ever told you this story. Because um, he, he had fashion in his blood. Is this where he's selling t-shirts? Selling t-shirts, yeah. Yeah. So what he was doing, well, no, no, no. He was selling t-shirts crossing the border illegally with to buy t-shirts in New York and bring them back to Canada. Yes. There's that. Um, uh, but no, he was like eight years old and he was running for school council or something or president. And But they had no hot water in the house. 
and this is in Montreal. It's freezing yeah. cold. There's snow on the ground. So he was walk. He'd go to his neighbors um, to take a shower and then put on like a, a suit to go to school. Wow. And run for office, or he wanted to like you know win win presidency. And um, so the opening in my mind was you know a, a snowstorm um, in, in like a, a small little neighborhood in Montreal and little dove comes out of the one house, walks down wearing these big snow boots, but yeah. like in, un, in those like American yeah, yeah. apparel, tidy whities <laughs> like walking sure. to the, to the neighbors coming up, knocking on the door. Hey, water out again. Yeah. Come on in kid. You know, so she yeah, brings yeah. him in, he showers and puts on the suit and then goes to school. And that was going to be the opening of That's the whole amazing. thing. That's amazing. He told me a story. He was arrested at like 11 or 12 years old selling bootleg Madonna t-shirts outside the Montreal Forum. Yeah. So there's some part of him that was like a hustler, hustler from yeah. the very beginning. That was his greatness. But then ultimately, you know, he can't he can't turn it off. Yep. Yeah. There was no part of him that could retire, that could hand over control, um, that could s- staff around him like anyone. Like in retrospect, that I worked there was insane. Mm-hmm. Not that I continued to work there, but who hires a 21 year old with basically no experience to run the marketing for your publicly traded company? It was insane, like yeah. the whole thing. But I realized that for the same reason he liked to hook up with like these store employees, he hired me because I was not threatening. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And that I could be manipulated and controlled. Like there oh, was yeah. a grooming there too. It wasn't, it mm-hmm. wasn't the same kind of. Uh, sexual thing, but there was a there. It was still fundamentally exploitative. Like when you walked around, like n- almost none of us had any business working there or being there because he should have had the best people in fashion working there. But he had us mm-hmm. because it could facilitate the sort of secondary purpose mm-hmm. of all of it, which was the wound. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 yeah. I get that. I get that you you know you create sort of uh, un, like lack of accountability in the youngsters you bring in because they don't have the capacity to hold you accountable yes. and they're just happy to be there and yes. they're like I'm the head of this and I'm 21 like sure. I, I don't this is a good thing yeah yeah it's it's like Hollywood it's yes. Hollywood <laughs> yes of course you know well, when you're grooming the kids to be you know little yeah, you starlets start as an, or you start as an assistant and then you work and you see the behavior the bad behaviors modeled mm-hmm. and it becomes normalized so when I left one of the big parts for me was like sort of just relearning how to be a person how to be a colleague how to be a boss because I'd seen what I thought successful people did but actually only manic unhinged, like, uh, you know, crazy people did. Mm-hmm. And so it worked for him in that one environment, but it wasn't, they weren't transferable skills. And it also wasn't like, it wasn't what I wanted my life to be. Yeah, you, you grew out of it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I was very lucky also. I think the one, like, so I was with my wife the entire time I worked there. So there was a whole set of behavior slash world that I was not only not interested in, but not invited to, you know, like uh-huh. Dove wasn't like, come stay at my house. Like, you know what I mean? Come stay at my house. Right. Cause he knew that like, both I appreciate that he respected it, but I he probably also sensed right. something in me. He was right. like, this isn't someone that will wants to participate in my extracurricular activities. Uh-huh. So I never got sucked into it in the way that I'm sure was, in Hollywood, there wasn't like, we have to protect Adrian. No, you you were sucked into the very mm-hmm. world that you were fictionally portraying, but it wasn't fictional, it was your actual yeah. life. Yeah, 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 and there's a lot of reward in it, you know? Sure. It's designed to, to keep you there. Well, that uh, person's probably easier to control, easier to take, like if you're living outside your means, if you're in some sort of oblivion slash, you know, like not taking, like, to like go here, like you're easier to make, to do stuff Mm -hmm. and to not question stuff and to not, it's like also, it's like if you're too sucked into the present moment, then you can't think about what things mean or where you're going to end. You know, you you can't think like big picture. Mm. Yeah. 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 So you just, did you just get up one day and walk away or did it 
did it did someone end it for you or how do, how do you no, I, I i had to say no i had to i called my agents and i i i said um and i and i i, I was in tears i yeah. I, we, I wept because i i quit acting i said you know i re really respect you and i don't want you to 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 put any effort or work when I'm gonna not take anything. Yeah. I'm going to just, because in many ways, um, acting wasn't something that I had to do. It wasn't something I sure. wanted to do. I was just doing it. Cause you're good at it and got paid for it. I got paid for it. I, 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 could, I could be the man instead of being a man, mm. you know? And sure. so all the ego things and all the, um, yeah, it just it was something I had to reject fully before I and, and I, I'll act now. Like I I can say no now. Yeah. Now I know how to say no, <laughs> so I'm open to acting. And by the way, in, in our neighborhood, there's like they film shit all the time it, now. It's well, hilarious. yeah, there, there's like a a hub here. Yeah. So which is going to be great because I say no to so many projects now because it takes me away from my family. Yeah, you know, for extended periods of time or the content, like I, <laughs> like I'm, I, I'm, I want to do. Um, I only want to do like things that I would want, I would be proud of for my kids. Yeah, you know, my my wife was like, "Do you think we'll ever let our son watch Entourage?" And I'm like, "Oh my god, I, that's like giving me a, a headache sure. just trying to, you know, Hopefully get my not head at around." Seventeen, that. yeah. You know, there's going to be a point when I'm going to have to, you know, share with my son the, where I come from and who yeah. I am and, you know, the things I've done and, um, you know, how I've overcome. Sure. You know, I, I, just not, not yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Mm. What is it like to be famous? You should know. Come on. Nah, that's not the same. No, why? No. Uh, authors are famous in a very, first off, because... Uh, only with a small fraction of the Your population. Social media famous. Social media famous is it's also it is it it is interesting and different. Um, it was weird for me also because like a lot of it happened during the pandemic. So like I was like not around like life was different. So like my level of being recognizable was going up, but I wasn't in a position to be recognized. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And then when that's changed, then it was like, oh whoa, this is so it was like it was like accumulating but i wasn't experiencing mm -hmm. it so that was a little bit disorienting but there's i mean you were you were famous and you were playing a famous person right. so that must have been that's well, there, like there's a thing called interesting. a pure celebrity right yeah. where you're famous for being famous yeah so you have like you know the, the paris hiltons of the world and whatever and, and in many ways i was a pure celebrity because i was famous for being famous on tv oh yeah right extra yeah. weird yes <laughs> so um but you know, it, it, anyone who's famous has to deal with that. They have to confront that reality. And, and you know, I, at one point after I made my, my film Teenage Paparazzo, which is basically me figuring out what it's like to be famous and what the hell this... When I woke up one day and people are like standing outside my door taking pictures, you know, of me, like yeah. paparazzi, it's just something you have to confront. It's like, yeah. holy, what is this? What is going on? Why me? Yeah. What, you know, and and I think you see varying degrees of celebrities dealing with their fame. Yeah. And and they deal with it in different ways. So the way I dealt with it is I made a film and I humbled myself in some ways. So I was keeping myself um, on some level, gi giving myself perspective. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and then at the same time, indulging in it, you know? But I think a lot of times any famous person will they they need to believe their bullshit they need to believe that they're somehow special so they will do everything they can to maintain that status yeah and they will they will surround themselves with yes people who confirm it an entourage and they will if you will an entourage <laughs> of people who are like keep going yes and they will reject people who want to call them out right right or sure. or, or hold up a mirror and when i had my transformation, <clears throat> I had to uncouple with people who we had a mutual neurotic um, 
friendship, you know, like, yeah. tr- tr- <laughs> and, and, and we were um, sort of indulging each other in a lifestyle. Sure. And they they benefited from me being famous, and I benefited from them, you know, supporting that lifestyle. And so I lost a lot of friends. Friends. It must be weird, right? Because you 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 sort of are famous, but then you're playing someone who fame is such a big part of th- what that character is and that show you is. Find a, a culture. So you're having you know, to think reflection. about. You're having to think about both what you're experiencing and a level above what you're actually experiencing. So it, it was probably one of the reasons I imagine you were able to get out is that you had kind of an ironic distance from it in a way that an a- if you actually were that character in real life, yeah. you wouldn't have because it would have been all that you knew. Yeah. You weren't thinking about what it was like well, to be I, you. I remember I reluctantly took the part. Yeah, yeah, you sure. Know? I, I remember when... They came in to tell me I got the, the role, and for the first time, someone called me Vince yeah. in earnest because now I was the guy who. Sure. Uh, I hung my head. I was like, oh, man, this. Because I knew it was going to be successful, and I knew I was going to have to deal with all this stuff. Um, and it was funny. It's a funny story. The HBO came to me <clears throat> and with, with, an, with an idea, and they said, hey, how would you feel about us calling the character Adrian? Ooh. Well, we'll name the character Adrian Grenier um, instead of Vincent Chase, and and I was like, oh, that's an interesting. That that's yeah. curious. I, sure. I I liked it as an idea, yeah. as a concept, and I was almost going to go for it just because I thought it was a cool idea. And then I realized I was like, I will have no separation. Yeah. from sure. this character if I do that, yeah. zero. It will be me. Yeah. I will be it. Yeah. And so I said, no, thank God. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Even just that. Tiny difference was probably a, allowed you to jump in between two worlds. Oh yeah, big time, big time, and and just, um, it it was it was meta as fuck to say the least. Yeah, you know, and I I think part of my the way I adapted and the way I processed it was creating more reflections, more layers removed. Sure, uh, you know, um, by. By revealing it, by pulling the curtain back, showing like it's all just fake. Where yeah. this is not real. Like I'm, I'm just a guy. Yeah. You know all the, and that kept me honest. And and like you said, you had an idea of what Hollywood would be like. Yeah. When you got there, I kn- I thought I was gonna have a house on the hills. Yeah. Overlooking with the starlight, you know yeah. the sure. night, um, you know the the speckled L.A. at night. L.A. L.A. at night. I was gonna have a nice car, and I'd be driving through the hills of of sure of Beverly Hills or something. I I saw that. Yeah. I ended up living in Los Feliz. I lived with like a bunch of guys, um, not like entourage guys, yeah. but like friends, like roommates. Yeah. And we lived really just low to the ground, just cool, like hipsters. Yeah. And because I drove a Prius, you know? Because it wasn't actually as lucrative or uh, glamorous as you thought, or because you chose I to chose live I chose that. that. Right. I always like, as... Lost as I got in the lifestyle, and it was really more like my relationship to sex and women and attention. Yeah. Um, I st- I always was leery of fame going into it. Like yeah. I was like, I don't know if I want to do this whole fame sure. thing, which is why I was in Mexico doing documentaries. Yeah. Um, so I always made documentaries. I always played music. I always just tried to um, call, like just maintain my ego to some degree i did and i don't and i really believe that i didn't get i didn't get detrimentally i didn't like dove charney yeah, i was yeah. able to get out of it sure does does fame fuel ego or does ego seek fame i mean chicken and egg i guess yeah. right yeah um yeah i i think <sighs> It's it's funny right now because right now I'm ranching, yeah, <laughs> yeah, wrangling snakes and you know, being in a family man living out outside of Austin, yeah, um, and there's still a part of me that feels a little inadequate. Like I feel uh, like I because I don't have the same attention and accolades, sure, that I once did. And attention is very seductive and very addictive, yeah. And so there are times when I feel um, like a loser. 
I feel like I am not successful because people aren't telling me you're doing good. Right. Yay. I, I saw your show. And so that's something that I, I, I see is built within me. And that maybe that's an ego thing. Yeah. Where I, if I'm not getting that attention or that those accolades, then I feel like I, I'm, I'm, I'm a failure. I got to imagine, like, if you grow up feeling seen and valued and enough, you probably don't seek out any of the professions like the ones we have sought. Well, I think this must be my father thing. Yeah. Right. Because my dad <laughs> bounced. Yeah. So, you know, that's my wound. Like, I feel like if I, if I had felt understood, I probably wouldn't have spent so much time trying to figure out how to articulate and explain mm. and communicate what I'm feeling and thinking. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I'd just be a regular person or something. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have sought out, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have sought out the, the means that I make my living by because I, 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 I wouldn't, what it, one of the things it does for me, I wouldn't have needed to right. have done for me. Well, and we're all glad you suffered in such <laughs> ways because we like you. Well, thank you. We like what you've, you brought us. But if, you, if you're like someone who got enough attention as a kid, do you seek out a profession that is fundamentally about attention? You're like, I'm good. Just like, I'm sure like if you grow up never needing to think about money, mm -hmm. you're probably not like, I got to go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange make, like and yeah. make my fortune. Yeah. And, and I look at it from like a permaculture, you know, natural systems point of view, you know, like there, there's tension within us and there's certain driving forces, which yeah. may be neurotic or, you know, tra trauma based. They drive you, you know, ideally you don't have trauma, but at the same time, it's that very trauma that composts you into new life, you know? So, you know, I, I try not to be dogmatic about like, yeah. oh, one way or the other, but I, I appreciate my journey. I'm so happy to be where I'm at. And, you know, I wouldn't trade it necessarily. Uh, I was reading about this species of, uh, I think a conifer tree or whatever. It's in, it's in Canada. And um, it's like pine cones. Mm -hmm. They only become like fertile or can grow a new tree if unlocked by temperatures that are not naturally present. So basically only fire huh. allows it to germinate and grow. I'm probably using the wrong terms here. But the idea is like the forest fire isn't destroying this species. It needs the forest fire to unlock something in it. And that, that's probably true wow. about some some forms of like creativity mm -hmm. or ambition or whatever. Like mm -hmm. ideally you have a childhood or a life that doesn't subject you to the forces that unlock whatever that mm -hmm. is in you. Just like... Um, whatever the primal forces required to like kill in a war mm -hmm. or, you know, um, everyone probably has that, but only circumstances draw it out from a person or, or cultivate a specific kind of person into like the warrior life, let's mm. say. I think there's probably something about certain kinds of childhoods or certain kinds of experiences or moments in time that draw from someone these kind of certain callings. Yeah, yeah. Can we talk a little bit about Daily Dad? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so our, our series, Man Upright, is yeah. about, uh, you know, uh, men's work and, and being a better father. Yeah. And so <laughs> I was like, yes, this is such a great. So you wrote a book uh, called Daily Dad, which is mm -hmm. basically just uh, daily meditations from Stoke tradition on how to be a, fa a good father. Yeah, so, or a good parent. A good parent, yeah, yeah. there you go. Well, in my case, good yes. father. Yes, I mean, um, that, I, call, I call it a daily dad because I'm a dad, but the idea, like daily parent sounds weird, but that's, I hear from lots of women that also read it. That's yeah. What I'm saying, but. So do you find, um, it's a great book, by the way. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm halfway through it probably. It's, it's by day. You're supposed to, you should only be, you should only be like, well, maybe you're reading. No, I skipped things. ahead. But you're you're supposed to only read the days the days date. No, I I skipped right. So yes. I skipped. I've read like you know however many whenever, days. Whenever it came out, a couple yes. months worth. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but what was I going to say? So 
do you find like so you wrote the book you get it but do you are you able to practice those like do you find that you're able to actually embody those ideas th those philosophies that wisdom when you're in the moment with your kids well i i would say i wrote it to practice it right so when i wrote the daily stoic i found that not just writing the book but then doing this i've done the email every day since 2016 the, the process of taking a minute every day to think about like what my values say or what I'm aspiring to be like or what the greats have been like is this wonderful sort of meditative intention setting process. So then when we had kids, I had this idea like, I wonder if doing a parenting version of it would make me a better parent. So mm -hmm. the, the fact that more than one person reads it is like gravy for me because the, for the process mm -hmm. of doing it makes not just has made me better, but makes me better, mm -hmm. which I hope Im implies very clearly that I'm not good at any of it and that I'm trying to get better at it. So like I'm not writing the ideas like I this is what I have perfected, but it's more like here's something I'm thinking about or here's what the ideal is or here's what I'm trying to do. Like I'll give you an example um, I was just talking about with my wife. Like um, I heard someone smart say like don't tell your kids to be careful because that's a meaningless thing to shout. What you're saying is, I'm worried. I don't want you to get hurt, which is not, it's just true. That's your emotion. That's where be careful comes from because you don't want anything bad to happen to your kids. But that phrase doesn't provide any value or instruction, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. be careful is not a thing you can be. Um, so you should actually say something like, hey, what's your plan? Like, hey, um, try to, you know, put your arms out when you're on this, you know, narrow ledge or, hey, don't go so fast. You, you know, yell out some sort of actual instruction or value at. Mm -hmm. But like yesterday and every day before that, I find myself instinctively saying, like, be careful when my feral animal children are <laughs> doing dangerous shit, you know? So, right, yeah. so like, I know what I should say, and then I catch myself saying the wrong mm -hmm. thing. And then I try to go, okay, now that you've shouted this meaningless, mm -hmm. you know, warning, try to actually like help in some way. So I, it's, it's like, I guess what I'm saying is it's a process for me. And I hope what I found with the study of stoicism is like, when I first read it, um, when I was 19, versus what I was putting into practice when I was 20, versus what I was putting into practice when I was 25, mm -hmm. versus 35. It's not, it's not just, it's not, it's actually not incremental growth. It's logarithmic growth or exponential. Right. So it compounds with time. The, the longer you do it, at some point you start to actually see the benefits and the returns. Right, because I mean, you're essentially an expert in, in stoicism, right? right? I mean, you're... Yeah. I would say I'm I uh, I know the, the philosophy foremost intellectual well. of stoicism I, of our day. I know the <laughs> I know the philosophy well. I uh -huh. would not say I am an expert stoic. Then, like right. I make that distinction between right, the right. practice and the understanding. But um, you are meditating on it enough that it start, you start to internalize it and body it. Yes. So that when you look back over time, you realize, oh wow, I'm actually. Better than I was at 20, better than I was at 30, and so on. Yes. I don't know how old you are now. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and that's what I found uh, my, myself is it actually took me multiple years, several yeah. years to become the man that I am today so that I felt like I could be a good father. Yes. Because instead of telling the kid how to be or teaching them the Stoic philosophy, if I could just be it. Sure you know, they will just through osmosis absorb and and feel it um, embodied in me. Uh, I was talking about this with Samantha the other day. She said something like the most valuable skill a person could have is the ability to appropriately deal with frustration because life is frustrating and shit goes wrong and it's never the way you want it to be. And most people are really bad at dealing with frustration. And there's really no way to teach how to be good at dealing with frustration to your children other than getting better at dealing with frustration. Mm -hmm. And so just the process of understanding mm -hmm. what you're going through, mm -hmm. trying not to be the person that you would have been a year ago or 10 years ago. And then also when you make mistakes or you don't do it the way that you would have liked to do it, 
to be able to communicate, mm -hmm. reflect on, apologize for that. That's how you teach your kids mm -hmm. how to do it. Or like in your relationship with your wife, like yeah. how you show up for each other, how you work through conflict, all that stuff. Yeah. Okay, so to bring it all together, what do you do about media and your kids? Something that we're talking about a lot. You know, we have not, oh. you, you don't share. We don't do any pictures of their faces. Mm -hmm. um, that's, we start, we decided that at like day one, even though like my profile is much lower than, I just found like there was something, there was something first off kind of ethically wrong with like signing up for their kids for this thing that they right. didn't sign up for. Yes, yes. But I, I also know like when I think about, when I think about what you think when you're posting on social media, like, I hope I, I hope people like this. Yeah. I hope it's popular. I hope I get validation. Right. You know, I hope I get approval. I hope, I hope this grows my account. Like all those emotions, um, which social media is designed to exploit mm -hmm. in both individuals and famous people and brands and whatever. Yeah. I felt very uncomfortable with using my kids to get something out of that. Yeah. Like, yeah. hey, no one's really responding to what I've been doing lately. Cute let me, kid. Let, yeah. <laughs> call in call in the baby. Yeah. You know, I just really I just decided we weren't gonna do that. And it was I think it's been great from a privacy standpoint, but much better from a that's not a component of our relationship with our kids. We take lots of pictures of our kids. Could we probably be more present generally? Sure. Everyone could with their phone. Mm -hmm. But the pictures we are taking are for us or for people we know very mm -hmm. well that we are gonna share with directly, or it's for them. Like my son fell asleep two nights ago. Um, he wanted to watch the iPad and I didn't let him, but I did, you know, how your phone, you know, how the iPhone, like it, it makes like slideshows for you yeah, of yeah. memories. Sure. I was like, let's watch like when we went to the beach, mm -hmm. let's watch last year like we we watched memories together mm -hmm. like that's what i'm taking pictures of not for the facebook algorithm right and and what about exposing them to media are you um and it's it's hard i don't it's i mean a, I, I don't even so know if it's possible i don't think to, it is and it certainly wasn't in 2020 when we couldn't leave the house mm -hmm. and there was this idea of like we also have to work how do you like, so I think you're lucky in that you missed that with your kid. There, I think talking with parents who have kids the same age as ours, there is definitely an extra element. The screens are already addictive, but I can tell my, my oldest has, when he is stressed or afraid or feels overwhelmed, there's something about the screen that is magically soothing and mm. uh, we all comforting. know that because that's what it yeah. was for him when the world actually was scary for that period of time yeah i i did not grow up with iPhones yeah. and you know screens and i got my first flip phone in my early 20s like 22 yeah. i can't imagine these kids but at the same time Genie's out of the bottle. Yeah. Now we have AI. What is going to happen? And how do you how do you model for your kids as a dad, as a you know daily dad stoic? Yeah. Their relationship to phones and what would the stoics say about phones and such? One of the things we try to do with the phones is like I try to connect it to life, right? So it's like he's watching a YouTube video about somebody going on a road trip, let's say, or whatever. I go like, you know, we can do that. You want to go do that? Like, so like there are lots of things we have done in real life that he has learned about from first from the screens. So like when we try to introduce him to stuff or we try to, when we, what we're letting him watch, it's not just people playing video games, but it's people doing stuff in real life mm -hmm. to then so inspire us to go do stuff in real right. life. Right. Um, so I think to me, that's the relationship I had with the internet when I was a kid, right? It wasn't this immersive, all, you know, uh, encompassing thing. It was more like learning about stuff that you didn't know existed and then going and further down that rabbit. So we try to do that a lot. Um, 
but I, but I think um, I one of the reasons I continue to read physical books at home for sure is like I want to make sure my kids see me doing that a lot. Yeah, I mean, there's no complaints with reading books, right? Yeah, it's like read as many books as you want all day long, forever. But, yeah, but just something about the screen that feels different, and it is different, but it's also not different. <laughs> It is because the medium is a message, right? So it's like just uniform. Like yeah. whether it's educational or entertainment, it's all the same um, action, the same experience. There's not, there's not like the tactile visceral experience of smell, the smelling an old book or opening yeah. it or having to actually, I, I think it's very different. I, you're I not just, in your internal, you know, conversation where you're, you're, you're like challenging yourself inside and having to, to work at participating because you're participating when you're reading because you're also imagining what it is as opposed to just purely being a consumer and being told, you know, as a passive That's consumer. True. I mean, one, one unique experience I've had um, with, with my books is like, I hear from lots of people that, have, that, that didn't read a lot before they read my books. So they didn't think they liked books, they didn't grow up reading. And then, you know, somebody, gave them an audio book or they watched a YouTube video and mm-hmm. then came mm-hmm. and read it. And so like, I, I, I have tried to work on, I'm a physical book person. I mean, we're surrounded by books. I have a bookstore. I love books. I think books are the greatest invention in like the history of humankind. Um, but I try, to un- I try not to be snobbish about it. And I understand that different people have different journeys and different ways of learning. And so like, one, let's say it turns out that my son is not, one of my kids is not that way, right? Like they're, they're not a, a, a person who reads by learning. They learn by video or they learn by audio. Like I'm trying not to, I'm, I am trying to be relaxed about the different ways that we come to information. The same thing, I've talked to people who didn't read a lot as a kid and then they fell in love with it later. And so just also understanding that like people are on their own journey and that if you try to force or mold someone into being a certain way that you think is the only way or the best way, you'll probably not just, you'll probably not only not succeed, but you'll probably do damage. Like you'll probably m- push them further in the opposite direction. So like one of the things like finding out that my son is like very interested in, let's say YouTube or the specific YouTubers or whatever, I've tried to go like, let's think about who this person is and let's not just think about them as this thing on a screen but to talk about how like they're an entrepreneur this is a job and they have a cool job which is like this person plays video games for a living like that wasn't a thing when i was a kid you couldn't do that as your kid and and so like i i have tried to like meet my kids where they are with this stuff Mm -hmm. as opposed to projecting or judging He, he likes slack slack is that what that is oh he likes Minecraft. He's obsessed with Minecraft. Right, but I mean, watching people play Minecraft. Oh, yeah, yeah. He lo- he loves um he loves this kid Beck Bro Jack. Have That's you ever done that, calls. by the way? I mean, you must have. But played just like watch people play. Yes, it's extremely compelling. It's extreme. <laughs> it's it's, like, it seems insane that mm-hmm. it would even be remotely interesting, and then you realize no, it's actually fun about it. Is the same reason it was fun to play video games as a kid, which is not so much the game, but the ball busting and the jokes mm-hmm. and the narration that's happening as it's happening Mm -hmm. plus the immersiveness of the world i'm going to send you a a youtube channel of a guy who basically takes um games like the video games and he cuts them together uh in like a a a philosophical like um um uh uh, what's the word (laughs) a paper like no paper uh paper okay like a little philosophical diatribe oh. using video games. So it might be interesting because there's deeper yeah, wisdom yeah. and ideas. Essay is what I'm, I'm oh. trying to say. A, a okay. philosophical essay using video games. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, there's a big YouTuber that lives out here. I'm forgetting his name. Really? He like, he, oh, yeah, he right. shut he shoots, down. He shoots yeah. over here at a... Uh, yeah, and he like shut down all... He did something with like kids stayed up all night and camped out on the street. I'm forgetting his name. So it was a Mr. Beast guy. Yeah, Mr. Beast guy. It's a Mr. B guy, like a, like a guy associate. in the universe. Right, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. I think it was an Elgin. Yeah, this, we punch above our weight over here. 
Well, there's yeah, I think I think uh, there's only like ten of us, so it's a, it's a small. That's club. enough. That's enough. Let's. Who's the other actor that was out here? He's in the Marvel universe, I think, or the DC universe. Um, Zach. Yes. Zach Le- Levi. Yes. Yeah. Have you met him? I have. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess there's Elon also. Elon's on his way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't dump. It, it, don't dump treated shit in water the river. into our river, please. That's yeah, all. of course. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, maybe, maybe we should <laughs> keep that conversation for after cameras are yes. off. Um, I definitely want to. There, there's a lot of development around here, and I have been actively reaching out to developers to offer my um, per- permaculture design perspective. Oh, that's cool. Because if they're going to do it anyway, yeah. might as well put a bug in their ear and be like, "Hey, how, how are you dealing with water? Sure, you know what are you doing with wildlife?" And well, the one of the things trees. I've noticed about here that's kind of changed how I think about politically. Like, it's very hard to build in Austin, right? Um, permitting is hard. Um, there's zoning is bad. So there's a lot of nimbyism in in Austin that has made it extremely expensive to live in Austin. Like the house that I bought in East Austin, right? It's like one of those. It was because there was somewhat permissive zoning. Like somebody bought an old house and turned it into two little houses, like smaller houses, mm-hmm. um, because it's hard to build apartment complexes on, right? It's hard, even though people think Austin's blowing up, Austin has San Francisco level yeah. zoning restrictions yep. that are very exclusionary, ultimately have very racist origins. Like the, the reason you and I live, were able to live in East Austin is that the zoning was less restrictive on what was previously the segregated Mm -hmm. part of town. So Austin thinks, hey, we're protecting the environment by not allowing people to build and being restrictive. But then when you drive from Austin to Bastrop, what you notice is trailer parks Mm -hmm. and crappy houses and all sorts of things where as soon as you cross over the line, it is permissive. So Austin thinks they're preventing things from happening, but what they're actually doing is just bulldozing the beautiful land that's here, right? So instead of somebody being able to build an apartment complex that has density in Austin that would then lower prices and make it affordable or reasonable for people to live, they are essentially creating like shanty towns and ghettos in this county. And that's kind of changed how I think about things politically as I'm a pretty liberal person. And you think, hey, this is the right thing, but you don't understand how it's actually externalized, like, you think you're protecting the environment, but you're actually harming the environment. There's the same thing like um, they w- they wanted to build like some low cost housing down the road here, like on the other side of town, that's like next to a tire shop. It's not good land at all. Mm-hmm. But a bunch of people were like, well, I don't want low income housing, right? And so they, they all got together and they shut it down. Right. And those are people who see themselves as good people, as people who are stewards yeah, of the yeah, land. Not in my backyard. Community, but they yeah. don't realize that those people are gonna have to live somewhere. It's just gonna yeah. be in a worse place than that. Yeah. And uh, So I, I, you know, um, I'm gonna send you a deck yeah. of what we're doing at Kintsugi. Yeah. Kintsugi Ranch is, you know, our, I love the our name. property. And uh, we're, you know, we're essentially developing the land, but, you know, not for density, yeah. but for nature. Yeah, right? sure. So we'll have a number of people living there. But one thing that we are considering is who can afford to be there and what kind of um, apartment, what kind of uh, houses are we going to build yeah, sure. so that we can have as much range of diversity of humans, both low income and, and people who can you know, afford a little bigger place or whatever. And also the the demographic of people who we're yeah. inviting in. Because, uh, you know, when all said and done, we're going to have a community of, you know, 30, 35, 40 people right. living and working there. And um, so it's kind of cool to have your own little um, canvas to... Um, sure. Your own little canvas... Uh, to develop and zone and create, which so that's what I like about this neighborhood is I have a lot of control and leverage to do that. Um, a lot of leeway, I meant. So, have you been to Community Village or Community First community Village? First, yeah, mm-hmm. the, the homeless thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So cool. 
Yeah. And they're building like 3D printed houses out there? So uh, Icon, I'm talking yeah. to them because we're building a chapel on our, our property. Oh. So I want to do a 3D printed yeah. chapel. And I got a lot of ideas. I'm going to show you. I, I'm I would gonna, love that. I'm going to enlist you. I don't know if I can do an interview with one of these in my mouth. Oh, I just put it in the side. I suck <laughs> on it. It has caffeine in it. It's a, oh, it's it does the, have caffeine? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's not It's not a lukewarm water, but <laughs> what, how has being a parent changed you? How, like it's only been two months, but how do you feel like you've changed? <sighs> well, I feel I like mean, a lot of your change was leading up to it, which I, is better. I, I made the choice to change so that I can arrive for this moment. That's very beautiful. You know, and, and I, so I don't feel like I'm catching, playing catch up. Sure. Um, I'm really just settling into what I, what I've known I wanted. Yeah. And like deep down inside, the little boy in me who uh, sort of abandoned my romantic, like I, I was a one woman. When I was a kid, I told my mom, I'm a one woman man. Yeah. I'm eight years old. Yeah. And then I ended up becoming a fucking Finny playboy, Chase. right? Yeah. And it's like the, the, the disconnect. So I really came back to my true nature. It's like I'm, I'm married so happily married. My wife and I are getting along so well. And by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this, the girl who dumped me to set me s flat Your on rock my bottom. ass, my yeah. rock bottom, um, I ended up winning her back and we got married. So she, Jordan right, right, is right, the right. chick, you know, who basically um, slapped, I, I say it's like cosmic bit, bitch slap, karmic bit, bitch sure. slap. I had a moment like that. Yeah. When I when when American Apparel was sort of when Dove was fired and I came back and we were trying to turn the company around, I was this ball of stress and I my my identity and my life was so tied up in work. Sam and I were fighting all the time and I remember she was just like, I'm not doing this anymore. And I, I remember thinking like, Am I gonna lose this person? I've been with we've probably been together like ten years at that point. Am I gonna lose the person I've been with for ten years that's like made me better in all these ways? for like a consulting gig at a company mm -hmm. that's like, I didn't even start that at the end of the day, like I don't even care about like, and by the way, like the double whammy was like, I'd already written three books. Like I, I also had my other dream mm -hmm. that I'd achieved simultaneously. And meanwhile, like I'm fucking in an office all day. This is insane. And so that was like a huge, uh, that was a huge wake up call for me. So sometimes you need that. Like, I think sometimes people think being with someone it, they go, I don't have time for relationships or I'm focused on my career so I can't be with someone or I can't have kids. And you don't actually realize that, yes, being with someone ties you down, but if you're an ambitious or even somewhat egotistical person, like what it's actually doing is tying you down to planet Earth, like to reality. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. like Dove desperately needed to be married. Mm -hmm. He needed some counter ballast to prevent him from being all one thing. Yeah. And so it's actually it's actually been a sort of a huge yeah, and, and women have a knack of revealing yourself to you and pushing you to be better. They'll, sure. They'll they'll call you out when you're not being your best or uh, you know, when you're um they'll just, you know, the, yeah. the, the, I, I see my wife as the oracle. Mm -hmm. You know, she's the navigator. Yeah. Sure. Like you're going the wrong way. Turn yeah. left. Turn right. Okay. Yes, honey. Like okay, I'm on. Sure. And like I can just drive, go straight. That's and and you know take orders. <laughs> well, we talked Not about in a bad way, but we like, talked about saying no earlier. I think two ways having a spouse is makes it so much easier to say no because you can be like, I know I'm biased here. You tell me whether I should do this. Not tell me whether I'm allowed to do this or not. Right. But you know my values and you know our values and our values as a couple. Right. So as a less interested party, yeah. make this e make this choice easy for me. Mm -hmm. um, so that happens a lot. Yeah. And then and the there's a deep knowing, it's a felt experience. It's not, you know, intellectual or you're not rationalizing something. They feel it, you know, it's- The greatest thing that having kids does is it gives you perspective. Like you find out how much tolerance you had for bullshit before, that when you have kids, hopefully you no longer have tolerance for. Like I have in, in my office, which you may have seen, I remember you recorded something at my desk once. Yeah, yeah. I have 
uh, a picture of my kids, like a picture of my oldest, a picture of my youngest. And then in the middle, there's a sign that just says no. And the reminder for me there is not no generally, but that when I am saying yes to stuff, the random shit that comes in my inbox, I'm saying no to these two people. And that when I'm saying no to things that I don't need to do, Mm -hmm. I'm saying yes to these two people. And, And there is something magical about how understanding people are when you have young kids because they know what it's like and they feel guilty about the things that they did that they shouldn't have done mm-hmm, when they had kids. Mm-hmm. And so they leave you alone a little bit and they give you space and mm-hmm. they're tolerant. And so like, I, well, that's one thing I tell people is like, milk this for all that it's worth. You know, like I can't, my kid is sick is a magical excuse. I can't, my son has a doctor's appointment, uh, dance recital, you know, we're going on family vacation. Like, I got to be home in time for this. Yeah, that that was. Um, I remember. Uh, do you know Casey Neistat? Mm-mm. Uh, he's like a huge YouTuber uh, and great filmmaker. But he he. I remember um, he did me a huge favor one time. I asked him if he wanted to do something like go to dinner, and he goes, "I don't miss bath time." <laughs> and that was like I didn't have kids yet, so that felt weird to me. That felt like something like I don't know that right. like some g- gender excuse, stereotype yeah. that like somebody else does like that the wife does or right. that like, like my dad was never home in time for bath time. That was not his right. role in our family. So the idea that this person I respect whose work I respect is like, I don't miss bath time was really helpful to me and very practical. Like the idea that like I get home at night and I'm a dad at home, like that's my job has not just kept me out of trouble, but it's just eliminated even the consideration mm-hmm. of a whole bunch of things that ordinarily you get asked to do. Mm-hmm. And I, I, it wasn't like an overnight thing. It took time and I've made mistakes and, you know, sort of waffled. But like that idea of like, I get home to do X or I don't miss X. Mm-hmm. These are great, like hard and fast rules to practice as a parent that make you, by having the rule, it makes you the person that you mm-hmm. aspire to be. Yeah. It's, it's a container yeah. in, in which you can be more free in many ways. Yeah, like I remember I was talking to some very rich dude and I was telling him some version of this and he was like, no one would believe me if I said that because like uh, they know I have staff, right? Like they know, he, you know? And I was like, that's sad. Like that that sucks. Like I try to drive, like I, I'm the one that drives and a lot of the times picks my kids up. Like that's my, mm-hmm. that's my job. And that that's a, like, that's not a thing I'm ashamed of. It's like a, a part of my identity, right? Like I like it. I'm proud mm-hmm. of it. I like that I'm successful enough that I can make my own hours, that I can drop my kids off and pick them up. Yeah. And by making some of those choices, you can put yourself in the position to be the parent that you want to be. Mm-hmm. Well, we're very happy that so far we've, um, we haven't used a night nurse or nanny or anything we've been very just sh- her and i yeah um and you know we're, we're blessed that we can be but also we're blessed that we chose yeah to do it you know we're, we've made that choice um to 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 become the people that could hold yeah. that and look this is, there's there i when i say these things i try to stipulate that i'm not judging someone right, who yeah. can't do that especially people who have no choice right like they literally have to work this mount. They work in an industry where maternity leave or paternity leave. Everybody gets built. to decide how they live their life. Sort of, but but also like like look if you if you came to this country as an immigrant escaping persecution and now you you have to work incredible hours just to keep your kids in clothes. I'm not judging that. What I am talking about is people who have way more than enough and then tell themselves they're working for their family that they don't see Mm -hmm. to provide things for them that their kids don't need when actually what their kids have asked for is them. Mm -hmm. Like how, how, how wealthy are you if you can't afford to see your family? Yeah. Yep. That seems like it, like to me, having a very busy schedule is a form of poverty, not, like starvation poverty, but that's an impoverished way to live. Time is the most valuable thing. So how much time do you have to do the things that are important to you? One of the tricky things about writing is that as you succeed, you have more and more impositions on your time that take away from your ability to write. And so for me, like 
um, somebody gave me this advice once. His name is Austin Kleon. He's this great writer. He said, um, work, family, scene, pick two. Like your, your career, your family, or like the art scene, mm-hmm. parties, events, you know, mm. it's like pick two. And, uh, you know, I know which two I want. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, you can't, because you, you can't have it all. Nobody can well, have it all. Well, I, I, I might be able to actually. Okay. So um, I've, I'm building a community, right? That's my work. I think if so they- my li- work is the scene. Yes, but, or gotcha. if, they, if they live on your property, if it's community at that level, we're 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 veering close to some form of extended family at that yeah, point. Also, okay, fine, right? Like you've you've merged it together, yeah, yeah. in a way that is you know different than um, like I just uh, like I get this is again a champagne thing, but people will be like, oh, like we're going to Italy for two weeks, and I'm going like, cool, I like my kids, like you know what I mean, or like, mm-hmm. hey, we're all going like. Uh, hella skiing in British Columbia or something. I go, that sounds cool, but like, I like my, I like my kids. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm so happy where I am. And by design, I, you know, want to be able to merge my work, my work will, uh, play time yeah. together, together so that I can be with my kids to, and I say kids cause I plan on having more. Cause yeah, I'm, sure. I love it. man. <laughs> But yeah, you have to you have to design your life in that mm-hmm. way, you know, and that's that takes a little bit of um, thinking outside the box and the the, the courage to, to try it a new way. Sure. Um, I definitely I feel so so deeply grounded and re, re, uh, there's such a relief. I was always chasing, like always having to go somewhere, always having to be somewhere. It's like ah, oh. and uh, now there's just a calm. Uh, you know, and my son, I, oh, my son is, I can't wait for you to meet him. Yeah. He's so cute. <laughs> do you, um, do you ever worry that the future you will regret things that you turned down now? Like, like some, like, so let's say I get an offer to do something. I go, I don't need it. Um, I want to do this, but I sometimes go, yeah, but will Ryan 12 years from now go like, I really could use, we, I mean, we could use that now. I'll be honest, I'm not making as much money as I once did. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a part of me that's like, oh, are you gonna, you gonna, gonna regret run it? Yeah. You're gonna run out. You're gonna be, you're gonna be impoverished. You're gonna be, but I keep reminding myself, I can always live in a camper. Yeah. In the backyard, mm-hmm. you know, I can live low to the ground. I can live, the, you know, to me, I'm, I, I expand to meet my my opportunities and yeah. and, and and to. To, to, to live beyond, you know, just the the material, sure, you know, goods that I have, and and so I can live, I can live small, I can live large, and so I have that range. So I don't think I'll regret it because if, if if I ever dwindle down to a place where I feel like I'm struggling, you sell I some know shit. I know I can sell <laughs> I can sell some stuff, you know I can always. Um, do so I know I have the capacity to to earn. Yeah. But I choose now to be present with my kids. Yeah, there's a confidence in that too where you're like I earned this stuff not sim- like there's kind of like an imposter syndrome that comes or that goes along with creative success because it is so unpredictable and you do know people that, you know, their career falls off, but there there is a sense that like you didn't deserve it, you didn't earn it, didn't have anything to do right. with you. So of course it could Shut be taken away. Shut up and be away. thankful. Instead no. of going like, hey, like it was through savvy and skill and hard work that I did this. And even if it gets taken away, I still have most of those skills, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I will say like having the ranch and doing stuff, like anytime like I, I work with, like it's like someone's replacing the floors. I go like, you know, and then they, they say they're going to show up and they don't, don't mm-hmm. show up. And then the job was supposed to take two days, take six days and blah, yeah. blah, blah. I go, I'm confident in my ability to learn how to install floors, right? right? Like if everything and were to go to shit. it'll probably take you six days. Yeah. <laughs> but, but no, no, I was going to say like, but I, but I also know what I have that I could bank on if things went to shit is like, I do what I say and I show yeah. up and I don't uh-huh. cheat. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I go like, I, 
I, it's not that I could do anything um, because there's some things I can't do. But what I'm saying is that like part of that fear when you have creative success is like rooted in the idea that that's the only thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. And when you've done other things and you right. you have right. kind of I, a self-sufficiency. I can goal. always mend fences. Yeah, exactly. You know? I can do I, a lot of other I shit. I can always bring in money. I can always uh, <clears throat> live well if it's on a smaller piece of property or if it's a smaller house or it's an apartment share or whatever it is. Yeah. The, the important things are presence, love, family, community. And yeah, I, I rest assured that all the stuff and things can go away because they have. Yeah, and still find you know peace and happiness. There's Seneca, who was a very wealthy man, which some people thought was a contradiction between you know sort of philosophy and and you know um, that, that that there was a contradiction between being successful and being a philosopher. And, right. and he said no, there wasn't. But he did. He would practice this exercise. He he would. He would try to practice poverty like one day a month. Like he would slum it, slum yeah. it. Um, you know, eat bad food or go without food, wear crappy clothes, or walk the streets. Not being Seneca, right? Not in, in, in a wealthy Roman would have an entourage and the bodyguards, and he would just walk, you know, as a regular person. And the exercise he he said was to get to a place where he could say to himself, um, "Is this what I was afraid of?" and mm -hmm. not be afraid of it anymore. Because that is the paradox of um, success is that we think it will make us more secure, but it makes us less secure because now we don't want to lose it. Now we're afraid of going back to how we were. Right. Even though we were perfectly happy or we survived perfectly well before we had these things. Once we get mm -hmm. them, it seems inconceivable not to have them anymore. Yeah. Um, the things you own, own you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the status, like the, the mm -hmm. le, le, but when you, when you can go, hey, we... We went on a vacation. Instead of staying at the Four Seasons, we stayed at a motel on a road trip, and it was just as fun. You mm -hmm. go, oh yeah, I don't, it, I can't afford these things, so I do experience them, but I don't actually need them. They're not part of who I am. Mm -hmm. I'm not dependent on them, and so to have that ability not to be afraid of some different way of life is a, is a, kind of a superpower. Yeah, I mean, it's part of yeah, it's, it's, it's part of manifestation is is to uncouple yourself with the goal and to, to be grasping and clinging to it and really let things flow. Energy flows, you know, in nature, you know, yeah. when energy is stuck or stagnant, it breaks or it, it you know, it's, it's, it's missing from the, you know, um, it, it, it creates, it creates a knot in your, in your body. And then when, and same with money, yeah. I think wealth, um, is is an energy that needs to flow, and if if you're too hold on, if you're held on to it too tight, uh, it won't bring abundance. It'll actually bring the opposite. Yeah, and and a lot of people have abundance, but still, l their mindset is scarcity. Yes, exactly, yeah. and that's again not a not a particularly rich life. Right. You can have all the things, but still feel like you're lacking. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, and that that's definitely common if you were getting the things because you felt like you were lacking. Like you thought, hey, if, if I have a Ferrari, then I'm an important, you know, cool person. Like if you were right. trying to get the things to be a person, right. as opposed to just being a person who you likes take away some the things. Ferrari and, you know, there you are. Yeah, if you identify success with your success or your status or your possessions on the way up or when they're good, then you, by definition, are afraid to lose them. Mm -hmm. And everyone goes through slumps and transitions and mm -hmm. down periods. Yeah, it's how, how you, um, your resilience and how you actually get through the down, the down times is what makes you creates your character. Yeah. You know, when things are easy, it's like, yeah, okay. But can can you knowingly overcome adversity? That's the important thing. And I and I have confidence in that. Yeah. Yeah, and stripping things down and getting 
practicing. Up close and personal with them is a way of cultivating right. that kind of resilience. And, and back to death, the meditations on death. It's sure. like that is the one thing that we, we will all have to confront one day and, and to practice that and get good at it. So when it does happen, you can do it with ease and with courage and grace. Also, I think meditating on death strips away a lot of the pretension and the significance of these things that you're chasing. It's the great, it's the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. And and this is why it's helpful to go like, what would I do if I found out I had cancer? You'd mm -hmm. immediately stop caring about 80% mm -hmm. of the shit that you care about. Yeah. And the the truth is you do have cancer. Yeah. Like you you do you, you will die. You will die. Yeah. And so the the idea yeah. that you're like waiting for it to become real right. or like close to it, it's 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 silly. Yeah, and, and letting go of all the material things one step further is just letting go of the, ma the material flesh, you know, yeah. this 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 body, which is temp temporary. Well, and I'm sure that was part of the experience of the sort of rock bottom for you with your now wife, right? Like, so you're arguing about things, you're fighting about things, you have these disagreements over priorities or how mm -hmm. things should be. Then you lose that person, which mm -hmm. is a form of death, right? Mm -hmm. It's the death of mm -hmm. a relationship or a death of a future that you th you had taken for granted. And in an instant, none of those things become, yeah. like none of those things are important anymore. And so much of what we argue about or fight about there's an arrogance to it. There's an arrogance that you have forever, right? That's the sort of immortality delusion that we have. Or there's the arrogance that like the relationship can bear an unlimited amount of mistakes or stress mm -hmm. or entitlements or whatever it is. And then suddenly you, you are reminded of the precariousness of either of those things. And you go, I was just pretending, I give up on all of it. It's not actually important to yeah. me at all. Yeah, 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 it's true, it's true. Hmm. Anything else we should cover? I'm good. I think we should just keep doing this more often. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, I, I do want to come to your ranch. Of anytime. Yeah. Yeah. And is yours? Mine's mine's kind of ugly right now. In this, like, the only reason I I was thinking it was better to do this here is that what that's one thing I found during the pandemic. This is like a funny thing. Was like, um, we bought it in April of twenty. When was that? 2015 maybe but the point was it was amazing mm -hmm. and then you know it, you, you take it for granted right it just becomes normal that's where you live but like when when the pandemic shuts down in march of 2020 i realized how few marches and aprils i had spent at that place because i'm always traveling i was like I, it was experiencing the beauty and the, oh, yeah. the perfectness of it because that's the best time of weather in yep. this part of the country. Everything's green. Yep. Uh, it's not hot yet. Yep. And you're just like, oh, this is what it's like. This yeah. is why I fell in love with it. Um, and then we are in the we are in the, the Thro ugliest the part of the throes of a drought and you know hot, hot heat. Well, no, I, I mean, look, we'll wait till it gets pretty for yeah. you. Anytime. But um, I, I mainly want to just. Yeah, come out. You, your relationship to the work uh -huh. and and nature. Maybe you can come help me fix some fences. And <laughs> yeah, I'm down. We'll do that. Seriously. No, anytime. Yours is yours is fantastic. I'm I'm sending you this deck because yeah, please. Um, well, I'm gonna ask for some support. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I won't do it on camera so that you can say no. But no, sure. Um, you'll see. You'll see what I'm I'm up to. Now come out. We're uh. We're just hanging out. <laughs>